Miles, are we live? Yes, sir. We are ready to go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the virtual Pasco County Board of County Commission meeting of April 21st, 2020. And if we can remind everybody in the in the room, silence your electronic devices. Thanks for the pledge and invocation. Oh, merciful creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that we may one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America. To the Republic, which is stand, one nation, under God, so much for muting. <laughs> um, Mr. Snyder, will you actually please do the procedures for today? Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. On March 20th. I'm sorry, what about roll call? Uh, oh, well, we can go ahead and have a roll call now. And then we'll read procedures. Okay, uh, District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Here. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. District 3, Commissioner Here. Starkey. Here. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Here. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Here. District 2, Chairman Moore. Here. Thank you. Mr. Steinsteiner, go ahead and move forward with the procedures. On March 20th, uh, 2020, Governor DeSantis issued issued an executive order 2069 ended any florida statute that requires a quorum to be present in person or requires a local government entity to meet in a specific public place the order allowed the board to meet virtually usually using communications media technology a detailed advertisement was run in the tampa bay times indicating the board's intent to conduct a virtual meeting today Based on executive order number 2091, the governor's stay at home order, the conduct of a regular meeting would certainly not be in the spirit or intent of the, the order. Um, the process was, was established by, by the use of technology to provide, proceed in a manner as much like an in-person meeting as possible. The public has, is afforded an opportunity to make public comments either in writing or the use of communication technology that has been provided. Mr. Biles issued an emergency order on April 8, 2020, establishing the procedural rules for this meeting. Mr. Goldstein will go over the adoption of the board, with the Board of County Commissioners of those rules as a board action in R20, or R1 on today's agenda. Uh, you're required to take public comment on anything you're going to act upon pursuant to section 286.0114 Florida statute. Uh, we have several speakers that have signed up for general public comment, and it will be up to the board whether to entertain this comment of items that are not on today's agenda. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Steinsteiner. So with that being said, um, I will just ask the board, just give me a yay or nay, if you would like to allow the people for public comment that are speaking on something that's not on the agenda today. Again, remember the original its intent was to only allow people to speak something that was on today's agenda. So I'm just gonna call your name and uh, say yes or no, if you wanna allow the other people to speak. Commissioner Oakley, yes or no? Um, yes. I I don't mind taking some more uh, to speak at this time. So okay. I want every opportunity for the public to be able to speak. Mr. So. Starkey, yes or no? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Wells, yes or no? Yes, I'm fine with that. Commissioner Mariano, yes or no? Yes. Okay. So we're okay with that, Mr. Steinsteiner. We'll move forward with all the comment and allow the people that are speaking on something that's not today. But I will reiterate. Well, actually, I'll go over those procedures in a minute. But go ahead. You want to, let's move to R1 then. Mr. Mr. Chairman, one, one, one additional thing. That comment is still limited to those, to your traditional seeking of public comment, which is things that are within your purview. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. 
So before we move on with public comment and move on to the agenda after that, we do have to um, take action on item R1. And Mr. Steinsner, I think we'll pass that over to Mr. Goldstein. <laughs> That's correct. Mr. Goldstein will, will brief the board on this, my, this on R1. Okay, I'll read it. Let me just go ahead and read in the record real quick. Uh, resolution by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, adopting the rules and procedures for Pasco County public meetings, conducted through communications and media technology. Mr. Goldstein, please. This is David Goldstein, Chief Assistant County Attorney. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, as Jeff mentioned earlier, we're conducting this virtual meeting pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order 2069. Before I get into I want to point out that this executive order only lasts the duration of the governor's declared state of emergency, which now expires on May 8th of 2020. So unless the governor extends that state of emergency, we will not have the ability to meet virtually after May 8th. So right now we are planning for the planning commission to meet virtually on April 23rd and May, 8th, May 7th, and for the board to meet virtually on May 5th. However, after that, we are kind of in limbo because the governor has not yet extended executive order 20-69 beyond May 8th. However, Ralph Flair has made a request to the governor's office to extend our ability to meet virtually, at least through the end of May. We don't have an answer yet from the governor's office. Questions about the dates before I move to the rules? Okay, then I'll move to the rules. So turning to the rules and the resolution, we tried to draft the rules to make these meetings as close as possible to the board's historical practice. But there are exceptions that are necessary when you're operating in a virtual environment. First, there will be no physical location where the public can speak at the meeting. Even though they're in person today, the public cannot speak at the meetings in person. Instead, the public will be able to participate in the meetings by either pre-registering and calling in at a designated time, or by emailing in comments, documents, PowerPoint, or videos prior to the meeting, which may be read out loud or played at the meeting. The standard three minute time limit will apply to these forms of participation unless the chair approves additional time in advance of the virtual meeting. Although the virtual meetings are viewable through various inter internet based, television based media including Frontier, Spectrum, Pasco TV, et cetera. These media platforms will not be available for public comment or feedback. And it is my understanding that we have turned off any chat or commenting features in webinars. The second difference between a regular meeting is the voting members of the board, although some of you are there physically today, you do not have to be physically present to vote or be counted for quorum requirements. And this goes back to Jeff's statement earlier that the governor suspended any requirement to that you have physically present at the virtual meeting. In addition, the county attorney's office, clerk's office, county minister, county staff may also attend the meeting virtually, me myself, since I'm attending virtually, um, unless their physical attendance is required to conduct the virtual meeting. And some, are, some of you are physically there for that reason. Um, third point is that because most of us are attending virtually, it may be difficult for board records to capture everyone that speaks. Therefore the, therefore, the rules require all speakers to be recognized by the chair prior to speaking and require all on action items to be by roll call vote. That's important. You don't normally do your consent agenda by roll call vote or your regular items by roll call vote, but we are asking that all those be adopted by roll call vote in a virtual meeting. Fourth, in order to ensure that there's adequate resources to conduct a virtual meeting, the location of all virtual meetings will, for those that physically attend will be at the boardroom in Newport Ritchie. There will not be any virtual meetings conducted out of the Dade City boardroom. Fifth, um, there's no quasi-judicial items or public hearing items on today's agenda. However, when we get to those types of hearings, the rules allow all witnesses to be sworn in through either audio or video technology. However, because we still want the clerk to be able to identify the speaker that is swearing in, we will not do any mass swearing in of speakers, and each speaker of quasi judicial matters will be sworn in individually before they speak. Speaking of quasi judicial matters, I wanted to point out that not every jurisdiction in Florida is electing to hear quasi judicial matters virtually. The primary reason for this is that there's extra procedures required 
for a quasi-judicial matter, such as the right to cross-examination, and it may be difficult to present evidence and rebut witnesses when you're operating in a virtual environment. On the other hand, if you have a non-controversial quasi-judicial matter, and an example of that would be a conditional use for alcohol permit, it may be to continue, continue that item indefinitely until we can have regular meetings again. The rules have been drafted in a way to try to strike a balance between the land use applicant's desire to proceed with their application and the need to maintain minimum due process protections. For this reason, if a land applicant elects to proceed with their application virtually, we are asking them to recognize that cross-examination would not be effective in a virtual proceeding, so they must waive that right if they wish to proceed virtually. We have also asked them to waive any other arguments they may have to challenge the validity of the virtual meeting and accept any risks associated with proceeding virtually. All that being said, land use matters that have significant public opposition or that may not be a virtual meeting for reasons, and the rules recognize that the board's inherent authority to continue any item that the board does not feel is appropriate to proceed virtually. That's a brief summary of the rules, but I wanted to um, identify one change that we would like to make to the rules. Um, created the rules, we realized that the Tampa Bay Times has moved to a twice a week publication of their newspaper. This has created a hardship for the county staff in terms of getting their ads um, into the Tampa Bay Times in place and because they're requiring significantly more lead time to get the newspaper published. The rules as currently drafted require 10 days advance notice of the virtual meetings, but given the recent developments with the Tampa Bay Times, we're recommending be changed from 10 days to seven days. Um, with that, I will take any questions or comments about the rules. And typically, if any of you have concerns with how the rules address quasi-judicial matters, this would be an opportunity to change those rules. We are operating the, the county administrator's order, but the board has the power, obviously, to change the rules. If you have changes or comments or questions, the county attorney's recommending approval of R1 with the change of the notice deadline from 10 days to seven days. Thanks, David. And before I allow any questions, one reminder too, when you make a motion, state your name, you're making the motion. And if you make the second, state your name when you make the second too, please. Um, and then it'll go to roll call. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Commissioner, Goldstein? Commissioner Stark, yes, see your hand. Um, I don't have any questions. I was going to uh, move for approval of R1. This is Commissioner Starkey. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman, I'll second with further discussion. Jack Mariano. Okay, I have a second with further discussion. Go ahead with discussion. Uh, the House had passed a bill what we tried to get done a few years ago as far as to try to raise the requirements for advertising. Um, they, it passed with a pretty significant margin. I had just uh, received a text back from Senator Simpson who is willing to consider looking at this bill to get a change as well to give us flexibility so we can advertise it different ways to make it easier so we don't have to depend on the newspaper. Um, so with that said, uh, I, I strongly support the seven days as well. Thanks, sir. Any more um, comments? I have a this, is, this is David Goldstein. Just to clarify, the motion includes the change from ten to seven days, correct? Yes, I see a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey, a second by Commissioner Mariana. Madam Clerk, please call roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Motion passes 5 to 0. On. So we're going to move on to public comment now. Now is the time for public comment. Citizens are given an opportunity to comment on any item coming before the board during the public comment section. The board also takes public comment on items with place on a future agenda or other business under purview. Um, due to the COVID-19 operation to safeguard the well-being and safety of our citizens and staff, today's public comment will be handled differently. And we will only address items on the April 21st agenda. First, we will take public comment from callers that have pre-registered and are currently on queue. After we after we will read into the public record comments, documents, PowerPoints, or videos that have been identified by members of the public to be read out loud or played at the meeting, not to exceed three minutes for each. The new format does not waive the request that when you address the board, comments are not directed personally against the commissioner or team member, but rather at the issues. 
This provides mutual respect between the board members and the public. Those that are calling in now, after stating your name and address, for, and address for the clerk, timer will be activated and will start a countdown. After two minutes, one beep will sound, letting you know that only one minute remains. At the time it's up, two beeps will sound, indicating that three, your three minutes are up. Please note that calls actually will be disconnected today after the three minute mark. So make sure you get your all your comments in at three minutes. And just to reiterate, if there's any comments made directed to the staff or board members, that call will be terminated direct, uh, immediately at that time. So Madam Clerk, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to you. There's a number of people that have pre-registered to speak. I'll let you read their names off. And then I think we'll pass it on to Paula to bring the caller on. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do have eight people that registered for phone call and two people that um, submitted emails for public comment. Of the eight that registered via phone call, we have four on the line. We have Mr. John Seibart. Mr. Seibart, if you could please state your name and address for the record and start your comment. Hello, my name is John Seibart. I am the HOA president of the estate and I live at 8834 Poe Drive in Hudson, Florida. The reason I'm calling is I'm concerned about the Lynx Golf Course, which we know is closed. The course continues to need money. The drainage systems, detention and retention ponds still need maintenance and attention, which is not being done. The golf cart business that was I thought closed is still open and running. I was by there today and there's still employees and activity. The trees of course are still there and the fact that this course is really run down and the way they planted is not probably the best way. And you may add that those trees were planted uh, in a golf course setting and it's not a tree farm, it's not zoned for that. This impacts well over 1,000 homes. And again, I have said all of this before. I was also told by one of the commissioners that a tree farm is better than a closed golf course. And our friends and neighbors say, not so. That's not what we signed up for. We bought in this community because the homes look good, there was a golf course, there was a lot of activity going on. It's a nice place to live. The problem now is not only does the course look horrible, but we're concerned with our property values and the fact now there's a lot of activity with people going through the course. I've seen everything from people walking with a stroller, which is nice, bicycles, motorcycles, ATVs, even saw a Jeep drive through, you know, through the course, which is course right in my backyard. What we're looking to do is, is ask, request, and demand that the commissioners help us. You're our representative. You know, we, the homeowners, we need you to protect us, represent us, establish laws and ordinances that help the community, not hinder it. And we also, part of that, if, if all those things were taken care of, that will help keep our property values up. Commission, please, on behalf of not just my family and my friends, but the entire estate, Millwood Village, Beacon Woods, Beacon Point, you know, I, I can go on and on, but there's well over a thousand, thousand homes. Please adopt an ordinance that would require the entire course be mowed when the grass height reaches six or eight inches. Please put a stop to this property owner who has violated regulations and has allowed a business to operate in our community. Thank you, Mr. Seibart. Next caller. The next caller that I have listed is Suzanne Taldone. Ms. Taldone, if you could please state your name and address for the record and start your comment. Uh, yes, this is uh, Suzanne Green Taldone, 8751 Cranes Roost Drive, Newport Ritchie, Florida. 
The comfort station for the homeless has now opened just south of Ridge Road and US 19 intersection and is physically immediately on US 19. This is a free facility with two portable toilets, a hand washing station, and electrical outlets for charging phones for the homeless. The Coalition for the Homeless has established this comfort station and are now looking to extend the services provided and extend the hours. There are significant health problems, business concerns, and community relation concerns with this new program from the Coalition. Health concerns? Hepatitis A is still a major concern to Pasco County, and as reported at previous VOCC meetings, the highest concentration of these news cases was coming from 52 in Ridge Road. Human feces is a significant transfer agent. Poorly washed people, as well as hands, spread this disease. Why are we promoting an additional way to spread this deadly disease? The coronavirus are very serious problem also. As the toilets, are the toilets cleaned after every use? Appropriate distancing maintained between people when charging the phone or waiting in, to be next in line? Business concerns. The homeless have been accosting business patrons at US 19 and 52 for years. Many businesses have had to close their doors due to the relentless crime and loitering person. What is left? Congregating homeless people. The horrible experience currently seen at 52 and US 19 will now be duplicated at this intersection. Community relation concerns. Money for the homeless is a good, in good effective programs is a good idea. Toilets and electricity draw the homeless to a specific area is targeted concentration. Moving the homeless to Ridge Road within walking distance of the new housing resource center. This is a blatant move on the part of the coalition to provide additional support and assist homeless in staying in our neighborhood, providing support that is blocked by stipulations at youth lane. Again, congregation of the homeless. The Southgate Plaza Big Lots area was cleared of their homeless and large beautiful palm trees were planted on US 19. What are we getting? Porta potties and lines of homeless people on US 19. Is this putting our best foot forward to influence how others should think of us? This station should be in a non-business area. East Pasco is in dire need of homeless assistance. This station should be moved to a rural location in East Pasco. Commissioners, immediately move this comfort station, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Chairman, we had a caller um, that was in the queue that hung up. So I'll go to our final caller that is in the queue, who is Mr. Ken Dabbs. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record and start your comment. Hello? Mr. Dabbs? Hello? Mr. Dabbs, if you could please state your name. Okay, Paul, it seems, like, it seems like you dropped it. Let's go ahead and move on. Do we have anybody else on the line? Kim Dabbs. Oh, jeez. Oh, Mr. Dabbs? Yeah. All right, go, go to the next caller. Mark Alcott is disconnected. Just said that. All right. Um, I don't have, I do not have any other number six is on. Okay. So, um, our number six registered um, caller is Mr. Mark Cal Caluti. Mr. Caluti, if you could please state your name and address for the record and start your comment. Sir, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, oh I'm sorry. If you could please, yes. if you could please state your well, name and record. I'm sorry. If you could please state your name for the record and address. Mark Kalari. And your address, sir. 8312 U.S. Highway 19, Port Richie, Brooklyn's Automotive. Okay. Thank you. Now you can start your comments. <coughs> Call me off guard. <laughs> okay. I'm standing here right now. I'm watching somebody on 19 stumbling over to the spot where you're looking to put that facility, and. Um, I've been here for 30, 34 years, and I've watched people sleeping in the homeless, sleeping in the backyard and such, 
and um, they rob from businesses every once in a while. And uh, again, I think it would really evaluate Port Ritchie, the city of Port Ritchie, A, for just the, being out there on 19. It also probably could discourage customers from coming in because they don't want to be around such an environment. Not that there's anything wrong with these people. I understand we're all sick, okay? But it sort of like uh, puts a bad taste in people's mouths, especially the elderly and such. They have fears and such. So, um, again, I, and it evaluates the properties and everything else. So, I don't, you know, I, I just feel like it could be a better spot and uh, there's homeless here now sleeping. You know, this could turn into, you know, where maybe there's three people out there, but, you know, they'll probably be sleeping in the backyard where they could find a little bit of trees, you know, and, and, and enhance that by double and triple the amount. You know, um, I do get break-ins every once in a while. I don't report them because I just fix the door and I would call and I accept that's the way it is. But to enhance it to make it any worse, I think would be silly. Thank you for your comments. I just think it would be a better spot to put this off of 19. Are we good? Yes, sir. We received your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we do have the caller that dropped. He's back on the line. His name yeah. is Mr. Ken Dabbs. All right, I'll go ahead and name an address for the record for me, please. Mr. Chair, he hung up again. Okay, so um, if that was our last caller, uh, Madam Clerk, move on to um, the emails or attachments that you may have received regarding the record. Yes, sir. Our first um, email for public comment is from a Mr. Alan Ross. Address is 10221 Hilltop Drive, Newport Ritchie, Florida, 34654. Regarding the CBRS Maritime Master Plan for Coastal uh, County. To start, we would, we would have to have certain offshore areas designated as a dredge material disposal site. We have already done this at Dern, at Dern Key. Once designated as a spoil disposal site, you conduct dredge projects, placing the spoils at designated locations, and you now have a spoil island. Then you can change spoil island to barrier island. Dernke is the precedence here. It was a spoil island before it became Dernke Island. Dernke. At, ask, the, ask the county commissioners regarding open Dernke as a dredge spoil disposal site. Designate shoaling on the southwest, north, and northeast side of Green Key, Robert K. Reese Memorial Park, 200 feet seaward at the MLLW level as a spoil disposal site. Have the area 1.2 nautical miles offshore from Port Ritchie Channel North to Water Bayou Leisure Beach Canal as a dredge spoil disposal site. Have Hudson Beach from the boat launch channel east to the north to the next channel designated as a dredge spoil disposal site have the area from sea pines channel 1.2 nautical miles offshore north to sunwest canal designated as dredge spoil disposal site have the area 1.2 nautical miles offshore from the southwest canal north for one nautical mile towards aprica designated as a dredge disposal site once this happens once this has been done please adopt the Maritime Master Plan attached as Pasco County's Coastal Waterways Improvement Plan. Attached to the email is the Maritime Master Plan, creating a maritime sanctuary and aquatic preserve for coastal Pasco County. Using the restore funds and the John Shaffey uh, Coastal Barrier Resource System to protect Pasco County residents, the Harbors West Market redevelopment in progress and protecting our coastal habitats, mangroves, manatees, seagrasses, fish, wildlife, and other natural resources so prominent along our coastline. Currently, there is a gap in the CBRS between Anclote Island and Crystal River, leaving our Pasco County coastline vulnerable to the ravages of Mother Nature, mainly tropical storms and hurricanes affecting coastal erosions. 
flooding destruction of homesteads and businesses throughout this throughout our county one newport ritchie barrier island to start we have to have an offshore area designated as a dredge material disposal site this site will be located 1.2 miles offshore from fort ritchie channel north to leisure beach channel dredge a 200 foot wide canal to six foot on the eastern side of the spoil islands using these spoils to create a base after dredging is complete come in and create a bivalve reef on the western canal walls and seagrass beds between the canal and the shorelines then you finish by creating beaches along the west coast of the island this spoil site will then become the newly created coastal barrier island protecting pasco county salt springs state park we will also have to reactivate Dern Key Disposal Site and redesignate Green Key from the southern end just west of the public beach east to the boat launch area as a spoil disposal site as well. Number two, Double Hammock, Robert K. Reese Memorial Park, Green Key Beach, protecting the mangroves so important to our nature coast and alleviating flooding issues to Green Key and Double Hammock. Our proposal is to dredge is to dredge Oyster Creek and cross Bayou with a maintenance canal 100 feet wide and six feet deep the middle down the middle of both using these spoils to create a protective barrier island and parking area just seaward. That is time. The second and last um, email is from Dan Basher with an address of um, 8525 Danbury Lane. Regarding um, April 21st meeting of Pasco County Board of County Commissioners, property issues with closing Lynx golf course in the estates at Beacon Woods owned by Loman Lynx Inc. April 21st, 2020, Honorable Commissioners, I live at 8525 Danbury Lane in the east in the estates of Beacon Woods. Our home purchase is 2016 is located on what was T number one. We purchased this home greatly influenced by the location and the beauty of the golf course. However, the closing of the golf course and subsequent changes which have resulted in loss of both property value and attractiveness for any resale are not my main concern today. The safety of our home and community is now being impacted in two ways. One, the golf course area behind our home is the main holding area for the runoff of the street and, and storm drain system. Normally rain runs runoff travels through the street drain system and is held temporarily in the open basin of the golf space where it drains westward and or so and or is gradually is absorbed by the ground. To do this, the water must travel through coverts that uh, lies underneath between our homes and several others. These covert drains out behind my house, but are now partially blocked or diverted, causing water to pool up and be prevented their normal pathway to the planned drainage storage area, which has caused this blockage and division diversion in the improper plowing up and planting of trees by the landowner. Now the culvert's water egress is being trapped by deep ditches from the tractor wheels, which run through the drainage area, leaving hills and ditches unplanned for the water drainage system. We now have pools with active mosquito breeding, trash collection, and no attention to the vegetation that is now catching the water and creating more back it, backlog blockage. Sorry. Eventually, the coverts will be blocked and the water will fill up in the streets and possibly enter the homes and properties. We already have concern regarding mosquito-borne Zika and other things here in Florida and do not need this breeding in our own backyard. Number two, the water basin in the golf course also functions as a fire barrier to a great number of homes because Florida is the number one state for the lightning for lightning in the U.S. and is not reasonable to arbitrarily plant pine trees within the basin and in some cases just 25 feet from our homes. As someone who has lived in Colorado around pine trees, fire is a big concern. Most responsible homeowners would clear a much bigger gap away from this potential fire source. To make matters worse, pine trees are prone to beetle kill, which will further make them a greater fuel source for the overgrowth and weeds and other flammables growing in and around the newly planted pine shoots. It is only a matter of time before some fire occurs. It's only a matter of when. In summary, the landowner shows no regard for the community he has impacted and that's the end of time and that is all that i have for email um, via public comment
All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I appreciate it. Uh, next the order of business is the consent agenda. And Madam Clerk, um, I'm going to let you go ahead and read the pull sheet uh, with the items that are listed to be pulled. And after that, we'll ask the board members if they have any other consent items that need to be pulled. So, Madam Clerk, what items are being pulled? Item C6 is a withdrawal. Item C36 is a withdrawal. Item C56 is a withdrawal. Item C58 is a pull and discuss. And item C18 is a pull and discuss. For item C58, um, Commissioner Mariano would like to pull and discuss. Okay, before we pull those, uh, commissioners, any other items you'd like to pull? None, we'll do C18 first. Oh, would actually, sorry, go ahead. Can I get a motion to approve the rest, the remainder of the consent agenda, actually? Move approval of the consent agenda, Jack Mariano, remainder. Mike Wells, second. I have a motion by Commissioner Mariano, and I have a second by Commissioner Wells. Can you do a roll call, clerk, please. District Thank 1, you. Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Item passes 5 0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And we will go on um, with C18 or C18. Um, hey, can you hear me, Mr. Stark? Yes. Um, I'm trying to find my notes that I, I put on here. But um, on the demolition, I wondered if, um, Lean, sorry, my eye is wandering up. I wondered if, um, you know, sometimes when we demolish a property and I, Go back to Leisure Lane because I drive through there all the time. Sometimes when we demolish um, a structure, it becomes a dumping ground, and the county ends up usually being the one cleaning it up. Can the cost for uh, cleanup be added to the to that on that lien? And can the properties automatically be required to file with the sheriff for no trespassing, no dumping, and no more? Okay, so. Go ahead and who wants to answer that, Mr. Steinsteiner? Is that a question for you? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, be happy to answer that. So, unless the demolition lien is specific to the demolition, anything that occurs on the property after the the structure is taken down would have to go back through the code process for. Um, for trash and debris on the property and move forward again through your through your code in that manner. Um, is that policy or is that law? Because <laughs> I, I think law. that's efficient. That's law. I mean that your your demolition ordinance applies to the demolition. That's all you can lean for at that time. So then you would have then if it is in violation of another ordinance, you'd then have to that you then then have to go through the process for that other violation. And do you think there's a way to fix that so we don't have to um, that we could get it all done within one or does it have to stay separate like that? We can look at that, but I believe it, it you're going to end up having it separate. Now the the remainder of your question was I I I lost. So, I got so the trash and debris. What was the last sec section? Of it your was um, having them be required to um, uh, uh, get with the sheriff's department so that they can't have trespassing or dumping. You know, they have to have that sign up before the sheriff can um, evict someone from living on a property, and that's part of what we had going on here in Leisure Lane. So I'm just wondering if it can be part of that ordinance that we require it to be, um, have a notice, no dumping, no trespassing. Um, under your current ordinances, no, there is a, I think there may be a possibility that that, that could be added to your ordinances if we can we can draw the nexus between the demolition and further action or further uh, trespass on the property. All right, and um, uh, Administrator Biles sent text that Christy had answered my questions, but I don't. Oh, I see it now. It's under Dan and Paula, not under Christy. I don't know. 
I don't I don't see Christie stuff. It's it's, it's 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 consistent with what? There it is. Okay. Um, it's consistent. So, uh, those were my questions and board members. I don't know if you have any comments, but it seems to me once we demolish, sometimes we have the next problem is it's a dumping ground and we would immediately want it to be a sheriff to be able to to uh, in our code enforcement to, to enforcement quickly. Any other comments to this item? That's C18. Any other comments to this Mr. item? Mr. Chairman Jack Mariano for the comment. Commissioner Mariano. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, we get, bring up some great points and two of these homes are on Leisure Lane. Uh, it might be a good thing for us to kind of maybe you can reach out to Habitat to actually have, have them approach, but it'd be good to have us buy those two two extra homes or home lots in that area coming up in the future too. Well, I think they're low on um, funds, so we'll, that's a problem we'll need to address at a board meeting. <laughs> maybe we talk about it, Commissioner items. Any other questions or comments to the C-18? Commissioner Starkey. Second, Jack Mariano. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey for C to approve C-18 and I have a second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Motion passes 5-0. We will move on to C-58, Commissioner Mariano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a quick question for Mike Carbell. I asked him earlier, so he's got a good answer for us. Uh, there was a charge that was part of the uh, Covanta settle-up agreement was a, called a higher heating value adjustment of $257,000 as part of the fee. And I was just wondering, I know that if we have burned too much plastic in there that that can drive up the heat. I don't know if that was a tie-in with that, but Mike, if you could explain what that charge is and is there a way to there there a reduce way to... it for the future? The short answer is yes. Uh, it, it is higher amounts of, of plastic and, and packaging and such. I believe John Power is on the line and he can go into some more depth that I think will we'll get to the heart of the matter. Is John on the line? We got, I think we have to promote him. Yeah. Yes. Hello, Mr. Power. Mr. Yes. Power. Okay. This is uh, John Power, Solid Waste Director, of Pasco County. Uh, Mike is, is correct in what he was stating. Um, you know, we're nine point five percent of recycling efforts uh, without the glass than we were the previous year. So we are striving, you know, to to increase recycling and also reduce the amount of plastic in the waste stream. Last year we did eighty five hundred tons. Uh, that was in the year twenty nineteen uh, recyclables. But we also had to divert from the waste energy facility 46,000 tons, and we're projected next year to be 60,000 tons. So even though we are increasing recycling, the growth rate and the amount of garbage coming in far exceeds where we are recycling, but we are making every effort to, to do that. Sure. Right. And so while recycling has increased, it's, it's just the tremendous volume. I think, as you pointed out, 8,500 tons of recycling in 2019, which was up. Uh, even removing glass out of the waste stream, but when you've got close to 400,000 tons of of garbage just coming into the county, and we're we're diverting roughly, uh, it's like about 6,000 tons, 45 to yeah, 45,000 tons of that is going out of the county. We're operating that plant at max max capacity. Always opportunities. I think moving to twice a week, uh, I'm sorry, once a week recycling has has helped increase participation, and our data does show increased participation. Um, it's just a matter of of getting folks to 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 continue to do that. And and John, didn't we make some adjustments in, in our baseline contract uh, to increase? The, uh, uh, the the heating value, in other words, if we were if we were at a lower heating value before, so we're kind of working to to whittle away at that incentive, correct? That's correct. In 1991, we our contract was 4,800 BTU per pound. Uh, we negotiated the last time was about six years ago. We increased it to 5,000, and as you see on on our, I think it's R4 coming up. We are going to renegotiate the contract again, and that will be an issue that we will uh, look for as far as the county to increase that uh, BTU because it has just enough. All right, Mr. Chairman, if I could again. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there may be an opportunity here. Um, I, I think we did a phenomenal job going to weekly pickup for recycling. I, I will tell you, my own trash itself, we're probably down a third of what we what goes out. So maybe we should look at going to a 
a, a bin system where we have a bins for recycling as well to, to encourage it more for people. Uh, I'll say this, when we put our trash out, we've got like two different containers we use. One's like a blue container, one's like a, just a white regular trash receptacle container for recycling. I think if we take a more intense approach of having one container for your regular trash and the other for the bins, it may draw more attention. I will tell you, on my, in my neighborhood, I think there's less than 30% of the people that recycle. Uh, if we can get these numbers up, you know, we'll, we'll, an agenda item coming up later on is about spending $525 million to go build that third burner with all the maintenance that would be over the next five years. I think there's an opportunity here to go look at, let's go try to divert even more of these plastics that are out there. It'll help us with the number of quantity that comes in plus the return burn rate. This 257000 if you could put that into funding part of the bins that would be needed for the public, maybe that's a good way to go and let's get the haulers to the table again. But I think there's a huge opportunity here that we need to, to, to take a shot at. With that, I'll move approval of uh, the agenda item C58. A motion by Ms. Uh, Commissioner Mariano. I need a second. Second. This is Commissioner Starkey. I have a second by Commissioner Starkey. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1. Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Moore. Aye. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Motion passes 5 0. Moving on, we do have a time certain at 11 o'clock. It will be R3. So I want to team, can we get through R2? Next. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have Louis Carlisi who will present R2. Um, if we run over, it won't be very long. Okay, please proceed. Uh, R2 is a memorandum of uh, resolution of necessity uh, for the overpass road. As your as board is aware, is aware, this is the first step that we need to take. Um, before we can enter into condemnation, and that I'll turn it over to Lewis. Yes, good morning, everyone. This is Lewis Carlisi with the Pasco County Attorney's Office in Newport Richie. We also have uh, online Todd Lane, the consultant engineer from WSP USA in Tampa. Uh, we are here to recommend the approval of the resolution and necessity to acquire certain real properties that are necessary for the construction of the overpass road. And I-75 interchange project. Uh, the project itself lies just to the north of Wesley Chapel, and uh, we do have a PowerPoint. Hopefully, everybody can see. Uh, if we could get to slide two. Yes. Uh, the limits of this project, as shown here, this is a computer-generated aerial. The limits on the west side are Old Pasco Road at Overpass, and it goes over approximately one mile to the east, east of I-75, to Boyette Road. The purpose of this project is to enhance safety, traffic circulation, and uh, connectivity, and to reduce the congestion that currently exists along the interchanges at State Route 52 and I-75 to the north, and State Route 54 and I-75 to the south. Um, this, uh, this project involves the widening of overpass road from two lanes to four lanes. Can I, um, uh, can I interrupt you for a second? Someone needs yes. to mute their, everyone needs to be on mute because there's a lot of background noise. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, the project does involve uh, a widening of overpass road from two lanes to four lanes. And that'll be in the section of the west side between Old Pasco Road and I-75, and uh, to six lanes from I-75 to Boyette Road on the east. Uh, there were three different design alternatives that were considered, and the recommended design alternative was approved by this board uh, on in April of 2005. The other uh, phase of this project involves the interchange, which will connect overpass road to I-75. There were five designs that were considered and the recommended design was approved on April 23rd of 2013 by the Pasco County Board of County Commissioners. Uh, this design utilizes a flyover ramp that will connect 
the westbound traffic along Overpass Road to southbound I-75. So having con conducted the various studies and uh, cons considering various alternative alignments, issues of planning, safety, environmental concerns, and costs, it's been determined that the following parcel will be necessary in order to construct the overpass road and interchange project. If we could move to the slide. Okay, the next slide, if we can bring that up, should show parcel 116. Uh, okay, well, we'll start with this one. That's fine. Uh, this is 115, actually. Oh, and there we go. Okay. 116. This is the westernmost property. It's at the intersection, the northeast intersection of Old Pasco Road and Overpass Road. Uh, the, this is parcel 116 A, B, and C, parts A, B, and C, uh, combined for a total of 3.392 acres from approximately 38 acre parent track. Um, and this does show the, the limited access taking along the north side of Overpass Road. And this is a total of 3.392 acres. The next, bring that up. This is parcel 115, uh, just east of uh, 116 and uh, adjoin, abutting the west side of Interstate 75. Uh, this shows parts A, B, and D. The acreage uh, re required would be 9.012 acres from approximately 27.4 acre parent track. And, and this slide does show the limited access taking on the north side of Overpass Road, as well as a pond that you in a kind of a bluish color uh, on the north side. And hence the taking is a little bit larger on this particular property. And uh, finally, on the east side of I-75, this will be parcel 117, parts A, B, and C, again, showing the limited access taken on the north side of Overpass Road. The total required from this 112 and a half acre parcel would be 6.229 acres. So it's, uh, these are the properties that have been determined to be necessary for construction of the interstate uh, uh, 75 and uh, overpass road interchange project. And we are recommending approval of the resolution necessity for this purpose. And if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to right answer. Sorry, thank you. Anybody have any questions? Questions from the board at this time? Mr. Starkey. Please go yes. ahead. Um, I'm uh, on the map here and I see you've got Wesley Chapel District Park on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, you have a big school complex. Can you um, tell me uh, what the plan is for cyclists and pedestrians to be able to get to get from one side to the other? Okay, I, I may have to uh, refer that question to our engineer uh, if uh, Mr. Lane is is available. Yep, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, uh, we didn't include a typical section on this, but on that north side of Overpass Road, there's a 12-foot multi-use path or a 10-foot multi-use path. You can see the, the annotation on the you know north side of the, the graphic there, right underneath the graphical scale. And then a five foot sidewalk um, on the south side. And how does it so, get under 75? I'm trying to figure that out. It goes across I-75 on the bridge. Both go across on the bridge. Okay, and it's separated from the regular traffic? Yes. Yes, and, there's and, also um, a provision. There's also a provision for a five foot bicycle lane on the facility. Okay, so a 12 foot path and a five foot. Great. So that was cheaper than going underneath, huh? Like we did yes. up at 52. Okay. Excellent. That's my only question. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, uh, Jeff Stein Snyder. Florida law requires that the governing body make its own determination regarding necessity prior to enacting the resolution that's proposed, declaring necessity for acquiring the property through eminent domain. In making the determination, the board must consider safety factors, cost factors, long range planning issues, alternate alignments, and environmental considerations. 
you have you have been provided with a copy of Mr. Lane's uh, engineering memorandum of necessity, which the board can use as its basis for its decision. Okay. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, see that I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. This is Commissioner Starkey. Motion by Commissioner Starkey. I need a second. Second, Jack Mariano. I have a second for Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, we have a time certain for 11.05. Um, I do not want to move to another. I do not want to move to another um, regular agenda item. So I'm going to go ahead and move for one old business. So I'll start with Commissioner Oakley, and then we'll go back to the regular agenda at 11.05. So Commissioner Oakley. We're doing old business now. Just for yourself. We can keep, keep things flowing. Oh, wait, hear me? Time, out, time out. Actually, you know what? We're ready to go on the, let's yeah. back off that. I just got word that um, the EDC is ready now, so we can actually move them right with the okay. five time certain. So let's go back to me. Okay, we're going to move forward to R3. And I'll read that to the record of Second Amendment to the, well, I need the amended and restated cooperative funding agreement, Passive County Economic Development Council for coordinated economic development programming, additional microloan funding program of $2 million. Hopefully everybody has that in hand. And before I pass it off, oh, there we go. Excellent. So as we all know, many of our small businesses are hurting, you know, across the nation, but also in Pasco County. And, um, you know, so many of them applied for the PPP the federal um, loans, and they have not been able to succeed in receiving those. And, um, and these small businesses are their heart and soul in the life of, of our of our community and we want to be able to do something to help them so that um, we're going to go ahead and move on i think we'll start with dan you want to pass that off and then bring it to bill yes sir and i think bill's on the line uh, as a, as you mentioned this is a, a program we've actually i think bill and i and i think commissioner wells had a conversation about this about a month ago as we wanted to watch what the state and the federal government was going to do and then we, you brought it up again a week to 10 days ago to kind of move forward on this after what we saw the state and the federal government did with their different programs. Right. Uh, it, before I turn off the bill, as a reminder, R3, this is R3 plus the addendum documents that in R3 that were on the addendum that went out yesterday. So those are part of this agenda item. Correct. And so we worked with a program using penny funds uh, to develop a PASCO emergency business grant program that the EDC is going to run with us run with this and with that I will turn it over to Mr. Bill Cronin from the EDC to kind of go through the thought process and then how it's going to set up and how businesses can access that. Excellent. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. All sir. right. Um, so, so we're really happy about this partnership working with the, the county. The EDC and the county has come up with a um, uh, emergency grant fund for our small businesses. Uh, so for businesses that are 25 employees or less. And uh, we're anticipating with this ask um, at $2 million that that could help approximately about 400 of our businesses in Pasco County. Uh, the eligibility for those uh, businesses, they've got to have 25 employees or less. It is a grant, it's not a loan up to $5,000. Um, I'll go through some of the um, the other uh, requirements. If anyone slide. could advance the okay. slides, please. Yep, we got it. There we okay. go. Uh, ineligible businesses can't be engaged in any illegal activity. Uh, no principal of the business is, uh, can be delinquent on child support. Uh, business cannot be involved in any type of um, business that deals with sexual nature and the business cannot derive more than one third of its gross annual revenue 
from legal gambling. And uh, we're not necessarily talking about uh, uh, racing and those types of things, but some of our, our smaller businesses do sell lottery tickets. So that's um, why that provision is in there. Next slide, please. So the applicants, uh, in order to be eligible, they have to be registered in Pasco County in SunBiz, according to the state, as a Pasco registered business in operation as of March 1st of 2020. Uh, the owner has to be a Pasco County resident, uh, one to 25 employees, and uh, that includes part-time and 1099s as well. Uh, the business must have applied for federal disaster loan funding. That does not mean they have to be approved. Um, the idea is that uh, we'd like to see more of those federal funds coming our way, and we'd love for our businesses and encourage them to make application. We know that process is going to be considerably slower than uh, uh, than PASCO, but we would definitely like to see people uh, make that application. And if for some reason they cannot, uh, there is a, a, a provision for exceptions. Uh, the business and the business owner must be in good standing, meaning no active judgments, liens, bankruptcies, arbitration settlements requiring withholding of loans, uh, convicted felons, violation of court orders requiring the holding of funds for child support, court cost, or criminal victim reimbursement programs. Next slide, please. Uh, the eligible grant uses. So it, it is a, a, a grant, meaning you don't pay it back. However, the funds can only be used for eligible uh, expenses that we've included here, and that's rent, mortgage, utilities, and payroll. And they have to be used to cover that period between March, April, May, or June of this year. Uh, you will have to provide proof of expenditures during the compliance period which is uh, six months after the award of the grant. So when you when the site goes live, which uh, should be about the time that everyone says approve, we'll push the button and the website will go live, uh, the application requirements uh, and things to have on hand to make this as smooth a process as possible is your state of Florida business registra registration, and that can be found um, on SunBiz your Pasco County business tax receipt, a copy of your driver's license or your state ID showing your residency, a proof of federal disaster loan funding, and a full employee list as of March 1st of 2020. Um, our website will allow the user to do this even uh, using a smartphone, and they can snap pictures of these documents to upload as well. But I would urge everyone to make sure they have their documents in hand before they apply. Hey, Bill, uh, let me jump in real quick, just back up for you, just to correct one statement. Um, sure. If you do not have to have received federal grant funding, you have to show that you applied for that funding. That's correct. <clears throat> okay. That's that's absolutely correct. And and like I said, if if you have not applied, uh, there is a space for exceptions that will be considered. So it's an online basis. Um, it is first come, first served. Our, our system will allow for down to the nanosecond of uh, determining when your application came, comes in. Uh, when that website goes live, uh, we're asking to fund this, this fund initially with $2 million. And once those uh, funds are exhausted, um, we'll, we'll quit taking applications. So it will go fairly quick, and I would encourage people to have all their documentation ready to go. Um, the compliance, uh, in addition to providing the receipts over the next six months, showing that you've um, um, that you've spent the funds on those four categories, uh, you also have to take a two-hour free refocus workshop, and that's a virtual workshop that we offer through um, CoStarters and Smart Start to help businesses refocus uh, to be able to um, help provide some assistance for re resiliency for future. Um, and it's again, it's free. It'll be offered several times a month uh, virtually, and we'll keep records of anyone who takes that. Um, please uh, advance the slides. Again. Uh, one more, sorry. Okay. Um, I'll breeze through some of these Q and A's because we covered some of it all already. 
Uh, but if you have multiple businesses, um, you can, you, there's a cap, you can have two eligible businesses that apply, but they have to be distinctively different businesses. Um, we're, we're not looking for um, the companies that have multiple LLCs all in the same, um, in the same mailing address with only one employee covering all those LLCs. So these are for distinctively different businesses up to two. Um, and as far as if you zero down to the next slide, I think I've covered the others there. Uh, if your business is ineligible um, to receive funds from the CARES Act or from any of the federal funding, please indicate in the exception block and that will be taken into consideration. We will be meeting several times a day uh, with the review committees as these grants come in uh, to make this as smooth as possible. Uh, nonprofits can also apply and home-based businesses can apply, but only if they meet all the other qualifications. Um, and if, advance the slides, please. If you're foreign owned business, uh, foreign owned companies, it's, it, you can be foreign owned if the majority of your stock is, uh, is owned by a foreign entity, but as long as you meet the other qualifications, uh, being a PASCO resident, and uh, registered as a PASCO business. Um, if, if you don't include all the required documents, um, you can't apply. You have to do it all at once. So make sure you've got all of your, your paperwork ready to go and submit all at, at once. It will go much smoother. This is not a paper application. It must be completed online and submitted once you have all those documents. Now, once you get the grant, um, you will you will be notified and you'll be asked to provide your W-9 and we will go once again through the compliance pieces of it to make sure that you're ready to go and your uh, ACH information, your routing information for the bank. We will be using ACH to route these funds directly into your bank account. Um, this is going to guarantee that we get the money on the streets as fast as possible to help our local economy. Um, so, just from a, a reporting standpoint, please advance the um, slides through. Okay, for oh, back one, please. Okay, for for us to deliver the the program, uh, Pasco EDC is not making any money or charging any fees on this whatsoever. Uh, this is a com completely a pass through. Uh, it's twenty seven hundred dollars. It's costing us to process the ten ninety nines. If there's four hundred applicants. Uh, we've increased the website bandwidth uh, for the next uh, two months. My guess is this is going to go a lot faster than that. Uh, and we are uh, using Center State Bank for the ACH processing. Um, will cost us about $3,000, just over $3,000 to get this out on the streets as fast as possible. Uh, I would also um, like to let people know at this time, and you'll see more information forthcoming, that because it's going through the PASCO EDC as a 501c3, our private business and others can actually donate to this fund, just like they do the microloan fund. Um, and that will help to leverage some private sector dollars to help our small business. So I will stop there and uh, see if there's any questions uh, from the board. Again, really appreciate the fact that uh, there was such great teamwork from both uh, staff and from the uh, commissioners in getting this pushed through to make sure that our businesses uh, can get this money in hand and in our local economy as fast as possible. Bill, so let me, let's reiterate a couple of things and just bring them up so everybody knows, you know, full transparency for the public. Um, this committee will be made up of folks that have already um, had some experience on the committee for the micro loan program, correct? And some others. Yes. So we've got um, uh, several of them are bankers. So our micro loan committee also includes um, uh, staff from the county uh, as far as a compliance piece uh, and bankers that um, uh, will review the applications. Currently, we have 17 members on that committee that we can even break up into three committees. Mm -hmm. Um, to process these in batches uh, if need be, and they are ready to meet um, uh, even this evening. So um, I anticipate we'll be able to get some of these processed uh, within the next 24 hours. Good, thank you. And I want to, for the public's sake too, um, and this is what we talked about, you know, through this process is that 
Again, there's no elected officials on this committee. It's all private citizens, private business people, volunteers. Um, you know, for our for our own sake, if somebody wants to do this, they go straight to the EDC website. It does not go through the county. It does not go through county commission offices. We cannot apply for anybody. Again, full transparency. It goes everything goes straight to the EDC website. You click on it. You apply. Their committee reviews it. Um, right, Bill? That's that that is absolutely correct. And uh, the committee. Uh, is really just making sure that all of the uh, the paperwork is in order, and then uh, the only other piece of that is those the potential of exceptions uh, for the um, uh, federal uh, application if in fact somebody uh, had an exception. Okay, I know there's a lot of people watching today, so again, but the rest of it is really going to go very quickly, first come, first served, and, yeah. and I can't stress that enough. Right. So, so about if you have all your paperwork in front of you. Scanned and ready to go, ten minutes probably to do this application online. Right, it's pretty quick. Yeah, and if you're ready, we can go ahead and disclose the um, the, the website address because as soon as you say approve, um, yeah. and and again, I'm optimistic. Uh, yeah. As soon as you say approve, it'll be live. Why don't we? Uh, we'll let, we'll vote on it, and then we'll put that out. <laughs> okay, that let's sounds fair. Let's vote on that first, um, and then one more thing before I go to go to questions was um, oh, got it. And I forgot what I was going to say. It was pretty important. Um, well, you know, I, I'll come back to that. Um, any questions at this time ab about this program for our small businesses? Uh, Commissioner Starkey, I see with your hands up. Well, I also wanted to um, say how grateful I am that we're able to do this. You know, we saw some of the other communities doing it, and I was hoping we could find a way to do this. Um, I've also been in contact with Senator Simpson on finding out how many of our Pasco residents have not been able to access unemployment checks because that's that's another problem uh, you know I, I care very much for our small businesses i'm a small business owner i also want to be sure our employees are being able to have enough money to just cover their basic i mean our residents are covering their basic needs so um but i am uh, i am uh, very grateful for this effort and um and uh i'm sure it's going to go fast so thank you um, just go ahead and it's hard for me to see everybody close up. Anybody have any other questions or comments? I'm looking at Jeff the Mariano. Mariano, Commissioner Mariano. Thank you. Uh, two comments. First, I'd like to say uh, Commissioner Wells, Bill Cronin, uh, everybody involved with bringing this forward. I think it's a brilliant idea. Uh, when people voted for the Penny for Pasco many years ago, they expected to see some things from this. When we added economic development, I thought it was a great ad. But to actually find out a way to help the small businesses, especially in this tough time, is phenomenal. I got two thoughts that I had, and, and Mr. Cronin and I had to talk about it. I do like the language work that we put in there up to 5,000 per business. I mean, if we get overloaded, I want to keep the flexibility in there that, you know, let, let's say you want to make this up to like 800 companies you're going to help because you have like so many more to really keep that flexibility before you just cut it off at the floor. The other uh, thought that I had, and I'll go back, we can go back for a discussion on that, is if you've got a federal government program that everybody's applied for, that's great. But you may have some people that because the federal money ran out so quick, they didn't bother applying. I would hate to preclude them from being able to apply anyway. As long as they applied before they received their money, I think if you put that caveat in there, that makes it for those that didn't do the reach out because of the shortage of money from the feds and, and the lack of optimism of getting the money. I think we should kind of give them that flexibility. I, I'd like to have a discussion about those thoughts. Thanks. Okay, so Commissioner Mariano, um, yeah, I, I, I think you're saying, you know, one of the things when we were having the discussions with this was that $5,000 is, is great, but you know, we wanted to have an impact for these for these companies. I'll let Bill jump in or whoever else wants to jump in, but we want to have an impact for, uh, for these companies. Unfortunately, you know, you know 500000 might help a little bit, but, um, you know, you don't see too many leases for that for that amount of money, and uh, payroll is a little bit higher than that. But uh, Bill, why don't you jump in a little bit more and explain the reasoning and the rationale in that? Yeah, so so there's there's two big variables that uh, when you look at these type of grants, and one is company size, and one is the dollar amount, of course. And um, company size at twenty five or less, we felt covered uh, our small businesses and didn't get us into larger businesses that probably had the wherewithal uh, 
um, able to um, to handle some of these costs on their own. Um, the, the size, though, at five thousand dollars, and to Commissioner Moore's point, is is correct. You do need to be able to make sure it makes an impact. Um, and with five thousand dollars, you can actually uh, cover potentially a rent payment or mortgage payment, or at least something that the landlord would be willing to take. Um, if we did have an overwhelming response of thousands and thousands and thousands, we needed to make a decision, uh, we would come back to you and, and say, we probably need to look at smaller amounts or maybe even subsequent funding after this. But uh, right now, uh, we've identified that there's $2 million that could be used uh, for this fund. So that's how that, that math came into place. And then second to your second point on the um, exceptions, and that's the reason why we do have that uh, field for exceptions. If somebody couldn't apply, and there was quite a few companies here in Pasco and other places that um, for whatever reason got caught into some type of endless loop with their bankers and were not able to submit application by the time the phones ran out. And all of that can be considered uh, in that exception, and that's why we included the exception field for those companies. I hope that, that provides some uh, clarity. Okay, um, thank you. Commissioner Wells, Commissioner Oakley. Yes, sir. Um, if I could, a couple of things, and Bill Cronin, thank you for the collaboration I know you've had with Dan and, and our team and for everything you've done. And if you don't mind, Bill, I'd just like you to maybe update the board. I know back on April 10th, you know, in collaboration with Mr. Biles, you guys did the, the text message um, to every every resident in Pasco County. Maybe you can elaborate on that, on exactly how many hits you got. Um, I know we've got five employees, I believe, helping you to walk people through application process. If you can just update them on that and maybe also tell tell the commissioners about what, you know, collaboration you have with Fasano and what he's doing with the, with the um, BTRs. Sure, Real sure. Quick. Yeah, so, um, it, and I'll, I'll go back. Uh, March 17th, we started um, uh, working virtually and preparing, um, knowing that communication was going to be the lifeline for our small businesses um, in a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. So the first thing we did was we reached out to all of our manufacturers, tried to understand the status of whether or not um, uh, they were going to have to furlough or close or if they had supply chain issues and even started uh, looking at their their uh, capacity and capability to see if, in fact, they could manufacture alternate goods like PPE. Um, then we, our next approach was to contact all of our targeted businesses um, in in Pasco County. Uh, we worked with our staff, and then the county uh, offered uh, initially five employees to help us make that outreach. And now we have another five, so there's ten that are working in kind of a mini call center. Uh, that are reaching out to all of our targeted businesses to understand uh, what their challenges are, what their needs are, um, where there's pain points and where there's urgency um, so that our staff can follow up accordingly. And then for uh, businesses just in, in general across the boards, we did a reverse 911 pitch uh, push, uh, emergency management uh, worked with us to get that message out directing small businesses to our website uh, so that they could self-serve a lot of this information um, that still today is, is very easy to navigate and easy for companies to understand what assistance is available to them. And then uh, uh, after that, uh, we worked um, with, with uh, Senator uh, Tax Collector Mike Pisano to send a physical hard copy brochure of all those programs to all of the companies um, that had BPRs, business tax receipts in Pasco County so that they had that information at their fingertips when they needed it because we knew at the time they might not need it. They might need it in a week. They might need it in two weeks. So that was really important. Um, there's a lot of partnership going on here. And I think uh, between all the different agencies, whether it's uh, uh, BOCC, county staff, emergency management, tax collector's office, uh, we've seen so many people come together and understand that one of the most important things we do is take care of our existing business. And 
that's the best commercial that we have for uh, future business coming to Pasco as well too. So we have, uh, our team has been running um, 12 and 14 hour days. And I know with this grant coming up, uh, we've got some people that I think uh, have, have their uh, pajamas ready to go to uh, work on grants uh, uh, into the evening if they need to. All right, thanks, Bill. Commissioner Wells, <clears throat> Commissioner Wells, anything else you'd like to say or bring up? No, I just want to, and, and the residents that are that are watching this or listening to this understand the the measures we've already gone through to to help our small businesses and to educate folks. So, and they've just done an unbelievable job. So has Dan's team. So, thank you. Anything else, Commissioner Oakley? Anything else? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey. Um, I am for this for our small businesses, and uh, those 400 small businesses are going to go in, in a hurry, I think. Uh, I guess I got a question for Bill. Uh, Bill, do we have a slide that says about this grant for small business, just a one slide that we can put out on social media to get them to contact uh, the link that we need them to to uh, go ahead and fill out these applications? That's for at least key to ready to go. Tammy will get that to you. Yeah. yeah, everything's queued up, ready to go with the PIO's office and uh, with our communications department, but uh, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, okay, so with that, let's, let's get this thing moving, because as soon as we vote on it, it's going live. So if, everybody, if everybody's good, let's vote. Mr. Chairman? Uh, I move to approve. Yes. Uh, I'll second with discussion. Okay, uh, okay. so I move to approve. Mr. Mariano, I'm sorry. Starkey. I have a motion by Commissioner Stark. You have a second with discussion by Commissioner Mariano. Please go ahead. Right, and just to, just to follow up, and uh, again, I, I think this was very well discussed, very well vetted. The provisions are phenomenal in there. Bring out those two points I did bring out, and I think the first one covered as far as if they haven't applied or not. Uh, that, that looks like it's got some flexibility to it. The last thing I just leave you with as far as when you do get the applications, which I think we will get bombarded with it. Keep in mind, i give an example. There's a barber that's out there that's got like five employees. He's got a rent payment of 1800 a month. You might have a couple of people, really small businesses, that don't need the full five grand, or you could help that many more. So keeping the flexibility with the committee, I'll, I'll trust with it to go forward. And uh, I'm just, like I said, delighted as well that we've, we've taken creativity to, to help the small business people out there. So thank you. OK, thank you. I have a motion to second, Madam Clerk. A uh, motion by Commissioner Starkey, second by Commissioner Mariana. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. So with that, website www.pascoedc.com backslash Pasco dash grant. Is there a way to put that up on the board? We have that bill. Uh, unless unless your uh, your host has a copy of it, I don't know that they can uh, do that. I could I could put it on my screen and share it if you like. Yeah, that'll work. That yeah, actually would work. But again, I'll just keep reading it off in the meantime. www.pasco edc.com backslash pasco dash grant. You're good to go, Bill. If somebody wants to screenshot, screenshot it. There you go. No, I don't see it. No, it's not up yet, Bill. Oh, you don't see it? No, we'll have an IT department make sure you're up. We don't see it here. So in the meet here's what I can do. Put it back, put the camera back on me for a second. Oh, there you go. Beautiful. Thank you. Give that a second for people to screenshot it. Leave it up for a minute. A couple more seconds, set up. Again, excellent. Thank you, everybody, for the work on this. Thanks, everybody, for their support on this. I know we're going to help out uh, quite a few, um, obviously, small businesses with this. And um, I, 
Tell me if you hit the button. Yeah. Bill, you still there? Bill Cronin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Okay. Oh, it's live, I take it now, right? Yep. Yep. We're live. ready to go. Excellent. Okay, everybody, it's live. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Okay. Excellent. We're moving on to, okay, there's R2. One second here. R3. R4. Resolution by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, adopting standards and design construction of water, wastewater, and reclaimed water. Facilities dated February 20, 2020, providing for current standards to supersede, supersede previously adopted standards. Charles Cullen should be Good morning. Um, this is Charles Cullen, uh, Pasco Utilities Engineering Director. Uh, thank you for your time. We just heard from the EDC some great stuff there. Um, and before time and even during a tough time, we're, we're, we're growing county doing just absolutely beautiful, beautiful development stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going, growing our utility system by, by a percentage. And when, and when we talk about, we have over 1500, um, miles of pipe in our system. So when you're growing that at two or 3%, that, that's a lot of work that, that's supporting our, our new homes or new businesses and the jobs they're bringing. It's really, really in the area. Um, to be able to do that on, on a repeated basis and mutually successful for all our stakeholders. Uh, that's one of our really critical um, tool in our toolbox is, is the utility technical manual. And I think everyone, every, all our stakeholders uh, agree that it was time time for that data and brought before you for your consideration. Um, when we, we took on the, this this effort, we we gave ourselves some guiding principles that that we wanted to um, point toward its mission to provide excellent customer service. Definitely forefront and then um, make, make it mutually beneficial for all the stakeholders. And, and the two big stakeholders are, are obviously the, the care citizens and, and the development community that, that brings us the stuff. The development community, you can break down to their engineers, the, the contractors and developers themselves. Uh, and, and, and we also reached out to material manufacturers who kind of straddled that line of making it durable that are good for the long term for the ratepayers and affordable on, on the upfront. So um, we 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 had a, a formal process of rolling this out to the stakeholders. We, we had a, a couple of horizontal roundtable events uh, in November, January, um, and reached out to other people um, and many other ways possible. Um, we collected about 500 comments. Uh, had some back and forth on them, and and I think we're in a good, really good spot with the the Tampa Bay Builders Association, and our people, uh, stakeholders. Um, so with that, we, we had three goals to to achieve those missions, and that was to provide clarity. You know, part of the customer service is is letting people know exactly what they're going to need to do to get through our our process in as few steps as possible. Um, open up some opportunities for us to respond to questions, but hopefully make it clear enough that they don't even have to ask those questions. So we really try to make it as much of a as possible. Um, the second part is that that, that really critical part of, of what are the hard assets in the ground and where we really balance the, the affordability up front, infrastructure, uh, affordable so that we can make these developments affordable and then also make them durable and, and sustainable and that we're making the long-term rates affordable as well. Um, so so we, we, we updated our construction details based on, on, on those efforts. And then what we heard loud and clear from the development community is we recognize that, you know, we want to provide a good, good product just like you, uh, but we want to know when, when, when the rules change, and and what what we mutually agreed on is best is is to have a formal date that you're good with the current standards until this date is certain. And it seems like the two year cycle is, is the best time frame for it for that to occur. 
that being said, like I mentioned, we, we, we reached out to all the stakeholders, had a lot of feedback, um, but we are wanting to adopt this two-year cycle. We have some late additions that we got in as late as this week. Um, setting that in stone, we, we, we want to um, go through that same exercise that, that we afforded everyone else. So we will be back to the board in, in the next couple of um, meetings, um, but we did want to pre present this for your information and if you have any questions or direct for us. Questions for the board at this time. Entertain any questions? Mr. Chairman, Chairman. Commissioner Mariano? Uh, Commissioner Mariano, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, you know, when, when I hear the terms as far as, you know, all stakeholders involved, I will tell you there was one stakeholder that actually gave me a call today uh, showing some concern. So I'd like to get this looked at a little bit closer. I think horizontally we're probably good, but I think we need to make sure we look at the, the vertical effects that may happen. Um, when we talk about, um, having, you know, certain pipes go in at certain times. I remember years ago we talked about if we had a person coming in that was going to do an improvement and we wanted to have a larger pipe in there, he wouldn't have to pay for the larger pipe upsize. We would take the care of the difference of the cost of the pipe he needed to put in to put in. I want to make sure we have covered that ground. I don't know that we have. I'm seeing this for the first time uh, as this agenda has come forward. No discussion has been with myself. Um, and I know I'm not a technical guy anyway, but I want to see more stakeholders that may be affected by this that, that may want to look at it. Um, so I wouldn't mind continuance down a little bit. I, I, I like the approach of trying to improve standards. I've also got a supplier that I met uh, at a NACO conference back a couple of years, maybe actually last year. He actually tried to look at taking his product in, was going to save us a bunch of money. I would like our staff to be able to talk out and reach to him. They're supposed to do that conversation, but it never seems to have happen. So that could be another opportunity where these standards may be real good. They may be perfect. We may change nothing. But I want to at least keep the opportunity out there to have that discussion a little bit further. Thank you. So if I may, you brought up some very good points there. You know, so we, we, we brought up the two here just for, for the certainty. Um, we really want want to hear from both the developers and the manual uh, manufacturers the whole period. Um, we want to bring at the 18 month Here's everything we heard. Here's what we're proposing, and then uh, have a bunch of back and forth within that six-month period. Commissioner Mariano, is this going to, if I could, Mr. Chairman, to follow up? Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Mariano, is this going to change right now what we're doing, or are we going to wait for six months to before we actually make an official change? Mr. Chairman, well, let, let me let me wait for Commissioner Mariano's question to be answered. Okay. If the board adopts it, it would be in, in effect as of the date of the adoption. Mr. Mariano. If that's the case, then I would definitely prefer to wait. Thank you. Commissioner Oakley. Yes, sir. I, I'm concerned about this issue. I've, I've been working with them on it. Um, I've still talked to some stakeholders that still haven't had time to go through the complete document and have a good feel for what's being changed. And some of it actually seems to be very drastic for our, our county, but it might be the right thing. But I would still like to uh, meet with some of these uh, independently, the uh, developers or contractors out there that I've, I've talked to three or four of them today. and. They didn't even know it was coming before us today to even think this was going to be an item that uh, we were changing. So if they don't know it was coming before us, how do they know that's the right thing for us? I, I'm very concerned. I do not want to uh, move forward with this. I'm not saying it doesn't need to be done, but I don't want to come up with it right now. I want to weigh this out through stakeholders a little bit further. Any, uh, I'm going to go keep going through the commissioners. Commissioner Wells, Commissioner Starkey. Chairman Moore, okay. um, I agree with the other two commissioners. We, I'd like to sit down with staff on this, and I've gotten a few phone calls as well. I've gotten some positive phone calls too, but they still have some questions. So I would, I would recommend that we uh, move this down the road so we have time to meet with everybody. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Starkey. 
I haven't received any comments. Um, I thought this was a good thing. So, but it's interesting listening to the rest of you. Um, I am wondering if this was presented at the horizontal um, yes. task force. Um, I attended the last one and I didn't hear anything on this. So, was this at the horizontal group? Yes, ma'am. Um, the uh, it was presented at the November uh, November two thousand nineteen, and we followed up again in January two. So, okay, so that's our stakeholder group, guys, and I, I uh, am, am in contact with them a lot, and I, I didn't hear any issues, so I'm wondering who you're hearing from. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Starkey. Going back to the board, any other questions for the staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Please go ahead, Commissioner Oakley. I uh, I would like to see us put this back out and make sure that these stakeholders weigh in and have a chance to thoroughly go over it. Uh, again, I think there's some things in there that are good that probably should be changed, and I, I understand that, but I think there's issues in there we need to study. I don't believe we need to start something that's going to cost our developers and all. At this time, with the COVID-19, they've been all disrupted with their businesses. This probably will cost them uh, monies in that development so I, i'd really want to hold up on this before we uh, move forward on it. okay thank you commissioner oakley any other comments at this time commissioner mariano i concur with commissioner oakley okay commissioner mariano thank you sir okay so what i'm hearing here is I, i'm hearing three commissioners that have made that they would like to see this continued is that what i'm hearing yes commissioner mariano yes commissioner wells is that your Yes, it is. And then, Ron Oakley, yes. Okay. I was okay to pass it, but I can see what a three is at least three one, so I don't know where you are. Um, I Again, I haven't heard any negatives on this, and I attended the last meeting, and this didn't come up, but if it's a three, two, or four, one, um, let's I, I would make a motion to bring it to the next board meeting and um, give opportunity for a little discussion, I guess. Okay, so that's a motion by Commissioner Starkey to continue to the next board meeting. So I have a motion on the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would think we need to go a couple of months out to give us time to get with these different businesses, contractors or developers to go over this and be sure it's right before we bring it back. I think the next board meeting is too soon. And um, I mean, we've been through this COVID-19 and thank goodness for our citizens that have gone along with the order we've been under and all the help of them. But uh, I think that we've had uh, a little displacement of us between us and developers and some of these actions because actually some of them actually stopped doing work in some of these developments because of COVID-19, so. So Commissioner, what I'm hearing is that you agree with Commissioner Starkey about continuing this. You do not agree on the time frame. <clears throat> so what you have the opportunity to do now is amend that motion to a, a, a date or time certain if you would like to do that. So let me hear from staff um, what your thoughts are on when an appropriate time would be to bring it back. Average. Okay, hold on, I got you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yeah, want to that. Hold on, let me, let me Chairman. Let me go back. Hold on, hold on, hold on, everybody. Let me go back to Commissioner Oakley for a second. Mr. Go ahead. Chairman, I would like to um, move that, I don't know, three or four meetings out before we see it. I think May, I think it's, what is it, May 5th is our next virtual meeting. That is correct. I would like that out to um, end of June or, or 1st of July, actually. To look at that again. And I think by then we have time to get with the stakeholders and make sure everybody's clear on it and make sure that, uh, and again, I'll, I'll tell you some of those things are in there that probably should be done. And I, I feel good about some. There are some areas that, that still lead me to uh, be very concerned about doing that right away. Okay, thank you. So I heard, I thought I heard Mr. Steinsleiter jump. Mr. Chairman, you did. 
Um, this is not an advertised item in terms of it's not a public hearing. It's a regular item on your agenda. The board doesn't have to officially continue it if they don't wish to. If, I think staff, the administrator has gotten the direction that they need to do some more work before they bring it back. And so I don't know that the board needs an official motion uh, on, okay. on this issue that you can just ha have them work with their stakeholders a little bit further. Okay, so then I'll make this suggestion is that, um, and see if everybody's in agreement, that staff with each commissioner individually have this conversation and get everybody where they're comfortable and then we'll break that. We're we'll on agreement of that. Yes. Commissioner Jack Starkey, Mariano, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Starkey, yes. Commissioner yeah. Wells, are you okay with that? <coughs> yes. Okay, so there's the direct. Thank you. Okay, moving on. R5, approve authorization to begin negotiations via exempt purchase of justification, Covanta Pascal Inc., waste energy, uh, WTE, design, build, operate, DBO agreement for WTE expansion and continued facility operation not to exceed $525 million. Uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon, Justin Ressler, uh, Assistant Solid Waste Director. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, um, as, as we discussed earlier, uh, currently our waste energy facility is over capacity. Um, really, when we put out our master plan last year, we highlighted the goal here is, is to minimize landfilling through things like recycling and waste. Energy. And ultimately, that means an expansion of the facility. Um, given the waste growth that we've seen uh, over the past several years and, and continuing, um, and the timeline that's associated for a project like this, the department needs to begin this process now. Um, so what the slide highlights is what the county is looking for in a project scope. Uh, essentially, scope involves adding a 550 ton per day boiler to the existing waste to energy unit as well as supporting air pollution control devices um, one important part of this project is that we need to keep the current facility operating while we work so we can continue to process the trash that is coming in um, the second part of the project scope really involves operating all parts of the waste energy facility both the existing units and the new unit once it has commenced operation for a period of 10 years um, following the service agreement end date, which is currently set for 2024. Um, and, and we feel that keeping construction and operations with one vendor is critical, and we want to make sure that the, the people that are building this facility have a vested interest in keeping it running long term. So what the department did to look for qualified parties to conduct this work was release a formal request for information in January of this year. Um, the request was posted on BidNet and submitted for over a month. There was ultimately only one respondent, Covanta Energy, our current facility operator. And this is what this is consistent with what we've seen um, in the solid waste marketplace as Covanta has acquired many of the smaller waste energy players and is really a qualified firm with sufficient capitalization and experience to do this type of design, build, and operate work. Next slide, please. Now, so based on these facts, the department recommends approval to begin negotiations with Covanta. This request is only approval the procurement mechanism and we will bring the final contracts back to the board to review and approve once they are complete. We expect to have a finalized an agreement put together in, in less than 18 months, but it will take some time. Um, and it's also important to, to talk about the cost a little bit. Um, the price that we presented here does include both the construction and 10 years of facility operation. And those years of operation are from 2024 to 30, 2033. And so we've adjusted the price as such and that's a cumulative upper ceiling cost and, and we are confident that we can bring the project in below that amount but again we were we were asked to set a ceiling and so that's what we're presenting here um, you know with that that concludes this presentation does the board have any additional questions yes um any questions from the board at this time go ahead and raise your hand or call it out please mr chairman jack mariano mr mariano please go ahead Thank you. Um, I've got a few concerns. Uh, I will say when I first looked at the top of the agenda, I'm seeing 525 million. I got scared. Uh, I was glad to see 325 was for the maintenance of the 10 years. Um, but having said that, um, one of the big problems where waste energy, I think, hasn't taken off in this country is because we're not be able to get full return on the energy we produce. We get with a small fraction of that. With the way contracts have changed over the past 25 years, uh, we're not alone. There's, I think, 11 other facilities in the state that still don't get 
um, uh, they're, they're in jeopardy if they haven't lost already the, the revenues that they've got for creating all this energy because they used to be co capacity payments. I, th I think we need to work with Covanta to go to D.C. Uh, and work with our legislative delegations, uh, even with the whole state, and then maybe even go nationwide, to get some change in legislation so we can make more money on these plants. This is a huge investment. It's definitely the right thing to do, but we need to put ourselves in a better position. With the time it's going to take to devise this plan and, and put this in place anyway, we've got time to work the legislation. But I will tell you, I brought it up at the Florida Association of Counties. I brought it up at NACO. It hasn't taken the legs. I think it's going to take Covanta stepping up strong, getting us united together to go, you know, start knocking on some doors to try to make this happen. Um, the other thing I want to just kind of bring up an idea outside of this, which kind of ties to it and we, what we talked about earlier today, is about plastics. Um, the amount of plastics we can take out of the waste stream will be a critical thing. If for years, I was told differently that the plastics were actually good for the fuel. It's actually turned out to be a bad thing for the fuel. I would like us to see, at the same time we're doing this, to go put some type of an RFP out there to advertise to a company to come to Pasco County. We'll give you all the plastic you want. We'll try to give you some incentives where you can locate your business here, whatever they may be, and, and try to make a, a point to get, get someone to have to use this plastic that we've got here to create a better market. It'll save our transportation costs and create our own little uh, niche for, for getting rid of plastics. And when we can make, maybe make, help them make money, create some more jobs, and take us out of this uh, spiral that we're in so we can um, put ourselves in a better financial situation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mariano. Um, any other commissioners have any questions at this time? Comments at this time? Um, Commissioner sure. Oakley, I see your hand up. Commissioner Oakley, I see your hand up. Go ahead. I, um, I've looked at this issue and it, it, so it is a lot of money. Uh, I, under, I understand how, how it works, but uh, it's something we're going to need to do in the future, very near future. But it is a question about the power we're going to generate, how much money we're going to get back off of it. But uh, I think it's an item we need to, you know, pay close attention to and, and move forward. Thank you. So I see Commissioner Starkey, uh, Stark, you're back on. I lost you for a second. Did you have yeah. anything, Starkey? Yes, I just wanted to say I agree with Jack that um, we should encourage Covanta to um, and together with the, their local commissions that they are um, placed in um, to lobby for a better return on our investment. I think that's a good idea. Absolutely, and and there is a group within within Covena. I'm sorry, Justin Ressler, Assistant Salt Waste Director. Um, there are a group of uh, municipalities who who are working, you know, with Covena. They they do meet uh, once a year. We met last year in July to talk about a lot of these issues. I think we'll be meeting again um, in that same type of time frame. Um, we'll certainly bring those minutes to the board if requested and, and provide updates as, as we move forward on that. Commissioner Starkey. You know, we don't have our um, federal lobbyist anymore, which I disagree with, but um, I do think uh, we need to add this on a federal lobbying sheet. And uh, Jack, the next time we're up in Washington, this needs to be part of our discussion as we make the rounds. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Jack Mariano. Commissioner Mariano. Commissioner Starkey, I agree 100%. Uh, losing a federal lobbyist is not a good thing. If we did nothing else, like we did with Ridge Road, we hired one to get Ridge Road done. We finally got it done with our participation with Commissioner Wells, you and I going up there and everyone is supporting it every step of the way. I think maybe we need to do the same thing with this. Let's make this, it's that big a project, right? Let's go put a federal team together to go work on this one single issue for us and let's see if we can get this thing done. Well, I I would say let's get our federal lobbyist back and have him help us with this and then he can work on a lot of things. I, I will say he does continue to help me. Um, uh, he's let me know an apprenticeship grant has come out and he's, you know, sends me um, some uh, information that's important to the county. He's still doing that for us. So. But I would, I would bring him back. Okay. Commissioner, Thank you. Commissioner who? Mariano. Commissioner Mariano. Commissioner Mariano, sorry. Um, and Commissioner Starkey, I, I hear if we're going to go broad base with it if we need to, that's, that's so be it, because they are very helpful. They've got great information, and they can help us with other things such as apprentice programs or even other grants for trails, whatever else we're trying to get. Thank you. 
Mr. Wells, Mr. Oakley, anything else? None. What's the will? I will move. Commissioner Mariano, move approval. Commissioner Stark, yes. I have a motion by Commissioner Mariano, a second by Commissioner Starkey. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So, with that, unless there's a walk on I didn't see, that's it for the regular agenda. Mr. Biles, did I miss anything? No, sir. That's it for the regular agenda. Okay. So, we're going to go to old business. We'll start with Commissioner Oakley. Go ahead, sir. You hear me? Uh, I just have a few things to bring up today. I, of course, I'd like to uh, go through and thank uh, uh, Steinsider, attorney for our attorney team. They've done all the issues they've gone through with COVID-19. I thank them for all their effort. And, of course, that's ongoing. So, uh, Mr. Biles, I also appreciate everything you've done in your leadership during the COVID-19. Um, and directing our employees and how they have to work from home. I should just go out to all our employees. Uh, we have some great employees that uh, can work under certain these circumstances and, and provide and move the county government and what we need to be done done through these times. And I, I think it's, and I'm, I'm sure I'm along with all of our other commissioners, we feel the same way, how good a job they've been doing. And I certainly appreciate all that. Our first responders, our sheriff's department, I mean, it just continues to go on what great things they're doing out there. Our first responders have been out there, you might say on the, the battle line it, itself, not when they go out to a case, what they're going out to and what they're coming in contact to. So I certainly appreciate everything they do and their families for supporting them and working during this time. Uh, but, you can go right on through every department we have and, and see those kind of things happening in our government. And I certainly appreciate all of that and the support they give us to be able to carry out the things we need to carry out. Um, you know, we're talking about costs of a lot of things and um, I'm the vice chairman of Tampa Bay Water now and we had our budget meeting the other day and in that budget meeting, we our wholesale price on water for this coming year is two point five five nine zero which is the tenth year in a row that they've kept our wholesale water costs at this price in Tampa Bay Waters. That's a great thing to to keep moving forward and and not have a big expenditure or, or an expenditure that rises all the time. I know we see our electric doing that and other things, uh other bills and all moving up, but here they've been able to hold that wholesale water price which helps our customers out here in Pasco County. So I think that's a great thing. Also, I don't want to forget, um, I want to thank our citizens of Pasco County. I said thank you for this order from the governor and and we've done all that we can do. And it you know it comes down to each person doing their share. And I think our citizens have done that. So I really want to thank them for uh, sticking with us and going through the uh, restrictions and, and social distancing that we have to do. And because of it, I think um, the issue here with COVID-19 in Pasco County has been better than other places. And I think it'll continue because our citizens are a big part of, of what we do and what what we're affected by. So I'd like to thank them. And um, I know it's not over yet, um, but we do see a light at the end of a long tunnel. So we're going to work ourselves out of this and get back to some kind of normalcy. May not be what we knew before, but it'll be something um, not not as bad as being closed up in your house all the time. So, so appreciating it, all our all our staff, all our parks and recreation, all of them. So um, I, I can't express how much thanks that that I give each and every one of our people that are working out there that are taking care of the job that has to be done while all this is going on. Uh, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
I'm done. Okay, Can I guess I'm him? next because I can't hear him. <laughs> oh, sorry, that. we'll move on to Commissioner Starkey. Sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I want to give you an update on our flag county project in the county. And, uh, so this is uh, the Frontline Appreciation Group. And um, as soon as I heard this on TV, I um, immediately got one started with my staff. So we have one of the national, um, we have a national chapter of the Frontline Appreciation Group 2020 PASCO. We are raising funds to uh, feed the frontline folks in the hospitals. We have now fed um, over 100 people in two hospitals, the Bay, uh, North Bay and um, the uh, hospital in Date City. Um, we've raised over $3,000. And thank you very much, Commissioner Oakley, for contributing. Um, we will be doing the Zephyr Hills Hospital next. And we're working on, we're working with our HR staff uh, as we speak to get the number. Um, what happens is uh, we collect the money um, from our constituents and then we um, hire local restaurants in those communities to make the meals and then we deliver it outside to the hospital. We're not allowed to go in. And um, for everyone who contributes $100 or more, they get one of these yard signs that I purchased to put in your yard. And the hope is that we can keep spreading this around and um, get more and more funds to come in because we don't want to do it one time. We want to go back and re repeat the, um, this uh, show of appreciation to our frontliners. Um, also, um, I um, also attended that Tampa Bay Water uh, work shop and board meeting and I wanted you to know that uh, and I mentioned this once before I'm asking Tampa Bay Water to and the board to look at public use of Tampa Bay Water property I did this when I was on the Swift Mud board you know we you there was very little public recreation when I first got on that board and I think you can see now how much better it is and I'd like to do the same for Tampa Bay Water um, properties we have a, a gentleman's handshake agreement with Tampa Bay Water that we can put the Orange Belt Trail in the easement owned by Tampa Bay Water where necessary as we uh, construct that trail. We're getting ready to put a, an easement through in Hillsborough County from downtown Tampa to Lithia. And so it's going through a very some very congested area. So what a great place for those communities to get a public trail. Um, put in. So I'm excited about that discussion with Tampa Bay Water. We'll be bringing it up at our next strategic plan workshop. Um, so I got cleared from uh, my medical issue with my nose that I could finally exercise. So I took my bike and um, went down Starkey Boulevard to cross 54 for my first time and ride on the new Starkey Gap. And I almost got hit by a car which was very scary. Um, it was turning right on the State Road 54 as I was crossing 54. And uh, the car just pulled into the uh, intersection, did a rolling stop, bunch of kids and almost hit me. So yeah, big problem there. I've got a um, discussion coming up with DOT and I think the county and DOT were, were working on getting the funds to get that going right away. Um, I do uh, converse with the White House regularly, and I know uh, Commissioner Moore is conversing at the state level. Um, one of the issues I was bringing up was help for small farmers in Florida because it's such a big issue uh, that our Florida's farming season, especially especially produce, coincided with this shutdown of restaurants and schools, and Florida farmers are really being hurt. And um, I I'm real, was real happy to see they uh, responded very quickly um, to uh, coming up with the program to help farmers and especially uh, specialty produce farmers, which are the Florida farmers. Um, and great news on AmSkills, we've been asked to apply for um, a CARES Act, CARES Act funding to help bring rapid manufacturing training to people who um, have lost their jobs and need to be reskilled. So uh, we'll know, I think, in the next week or two if we're going to get that multi-million dollar grant. Uh, it's very exciting, and um, so you should know 
and skills is getting national recognition. Um, lastly, I wanted an update on the Key Vista dredge and any other dredge items that um, we haven't heard about in a while. And I think Dan, you're keyed up to a little update. Mike, you want to handle the dredge? Yes. Yeah, so, Commissioner, on the dredge, as you're aware, we have a contractor that is uh, pushing forward with uh, doing some field investigations. I'm happy to report that those field investigations are complete, and they are now taking that data to work on preliminary construction cost estimates. That would be the next step in order to get a, a, a more firm cost so we can figure out a, a funding source to go forward with uh, any any sort of proposed dredging activities in those areas. So on the cost, are we breaking that down by channel? Because there are some there are some channels that are like a collector or arterial road that are you know very important for the whole community, and there are some channels that are just specific for those people who live on those channels. So um, I yeah, wasn't sure. really it, okay with the how many channels we were investigating. And I want to be sure it's broken down. I'm, I'm sure that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. And what about the Key Vista project? That's part of the Restore Act. Um, I've been hearing for months and months and months that the application was in. And um, so. I'll have to get back with you on that one, Commissioner. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Wills. Yes, thank you. Um, just real quick, and I know Commissioner Oki did, I just, it goes without saying to thank, you know, Dan, Andy, your team has done an unbelievable job. The PowerPoints that we get, I can't always get on the calls, but the calls are very short, but the information provided has been unbelievable. I forwarded out, so I just want to thank you for that. I know the Sheriff's Office has done a great job, obviously collaborating with all of us and getting information out there. And just one other thing, if any of you know any small business restaurants. Um, I serve on the Area Agency on Aging Board. They got a federal grant to help us help homebound seniors to provide meals. So what the grant will do is pay a restaurant $10 per meal. Um, they have to meet guidelines, but they're able to possibly deliver to the seniors or deliver to one of our sites and we'll deliver to the seniors. I believe it goes live this week, Dan, if it hasn't already. Find the it yesterday. Yeah, and I know we just, we had some, we needed more restaurants from what I understand out yes, East, yes, East Pasco. Yes, so I'm just throwing it out there. If somebody listening is a small restaurant owner looking to obviously help seniors and, you know, we'll help them as far as federal funding. That's the idea is to support our small businesses. Right. And with that, Commissioner I'm, Wells. Go ahead. Maybe Commissioner Wells, you might jumping in. Um, maybe you can work with staff real quick and they could put something together that could be put out on social media for those people on East Pasco? Yeah, I've sent, I, like the Area Agents and Aging had something and we've already shared it, but it just needs to be shared again because she, they're having, they're need, they need some restaurants out in East Pasco. Right. So and yes, going we to the Area Agency on Aging and we're helping them. Yes, so, yeah. exactly. Okay, yes, good idea. Commissioner. Well, Go ahead, Commissioner Starkey. Um, I wanted to add that I, um, was on the phone with Congressman Bill Rackus yesterday and they and the and staff and they brought up that that we're also getting money for restaurants to make meals for anybody, not just the aging. And so um, when you get that messaging out, we're, we're getting money um, that for these restaurants where they can go and give meals made for homeless or food banks or whatever. So they're um, they're really trying to help these small restaurants, so that needs to get out. And I talked to Kathy Pearson about it yesterday, and she wasn't aware of that yet and was going to be researching that. But I know they said that money is there, and they wanted to be sure that we are participating in that part of that grant as well. So I don't want to take any more of Commissioner Wells' time. So, Commissioner Mr. Miles, if maybe you and Kathy can talk about that during your time that subject matter that Commissioner Starkey is bringing up and, and detail everybody on for her and us. Right. Thank you. Commissioner Wells, continue. That's all, sir. I'm good. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Wells. Commissioner Mariano, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on, on the key VISTA dredging, I am trying to get an uh, answer for Commissioner Starkey. Um, I think that's a, it's a different, that's a different pot of funding, so it was already funded, so just a matter of what the schedule is, so I'll get you that as quick as we can. Uh, 
I had a meeting with uh, FDEP uh, all about the dredging as far as like how the aquatic preserve was going to affect us. I will tell you, I didn't get too far with them, so I don't have any concrete answers about how it's going to affect us, but I'm going to be following up this coming week with a, with a response letter um, as we'll go forward. I, I, I still think I'm, I still have fearful about what, the, what they've done to us. Um, and I'm going to ask Mr. Biles, uh, did Mr. Bailey talk to you yesterday about the FEMA regulations that are coming up at the Planning Commission meeting for Thursday? We, we talked. Uh, we've not had a chance to circle back since I think he's going to talk to you again. I think there are some issues with that agenda item. I don't know what the final plan is, but he's on the phone. If, I mean, he's on the right. meeting. If, uh, so okay, so we need to circle back with you after we're done here. Or let me. I want to have a discussion f with the whole board right. so everybody knows. So I, I heard that we were, you know, with the new FEMA regulations that were coming in, I tell you, it's a huge benefit for all our coastal development. Uh, the, 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 the insurance rates are going to go down. You could probably see some development going in, whereas people, if they couldn't pay cash for a home, they wouldn't build. Now with these new maps, the way they're coming out, if you're in just a little bit, it is going to be much more beneficial and, and affordable to actually build waterfront property. It's something that's going to be very critical for the tax base and the demographics on the west side. Being that my district is two-thirds of it, I will tell you, when I express these concerns to this agenda item coming up and staff never get back to me and they just want to go forward to go through this, I find it very offensive. And I think all of us should be that we didn't get this thing back. So I want to see that agenda not go before the Planning Commission. I want to see it introduced to all the board members and talked about this before we just kind of put a law through that, you know, may be a, a big detriment. I've had a lot of battles, if you heard, at Bo Boatyard Lane where we had a seawall and a retaining wall we had to go deal with. I just don't want to see us do, go too restrictive that's going to really hurt the development here. So if I could just get it pulled back and get us all the information we should have before we pass something that we may regret later on, um, I'd just like to have the administrator say that he will have it pulled. That would be you, Mr. Biles. No, no, I was waiting to see if Todd. <laughs> yes, Commissioner, yeah, this is uh, Todd Bailey, acting, <laughs> acting County Administrator for Development Services. Um, yeah, we, I did a little cir circle back with staff. We did put out an email on March 13th to all the commissioners. However, being that COVID and the state of emergency were kicking off at that same time, we feared that it got lost with, uh, with the pandemic situation going on. So we probably need to go back and revisit that and um, make sure that it comes to everybody's attention. Staff did follow a protocol, but I, I do believe that it just got, it just fell through the cracks with, with all the more the health concerns going on around. So I, we'll circle back in that regard. Um, and I'll circle back with um, Dan. We did discuss it la late last evening. Staff did answer some of the questions that I forwarded to you this morning. Um, but we have not had time to circle back since this meeting started. So it's, it's pretty much on the front burner and we'll, we'll make a quick decision on it. I, I think it's it's going to be, sorry, uh, Commissioner Mariano. I think it's important, and, and, and I understand the COVID p epidemic, uh, pandemic has really affected a lot of communications, et cetera. So I, I don't get, you know, too tied up with it. But it's just something that, you know, just so we had this discussion this morning about water, wastewater, and, and pipes and all, and, and where the stakeholders reached. This is something where vertically it's going to affect a lot of people. And we don't have a vertical roundtable. We need a vertical roundtable. And this is a classic example of, before we go pass a law, let's go get the people in the room that are going to be directly affected with us, that know how to build on the coast and what we're going through right now. And, you know, Todd, you and I have had discussions already just about trying to do simple seawalls that are done the same way over and over again, but we make engineer setups go in. So before we go and even have the Planning Commission look at this, let's go study this, uh, do a, a vertical roundtable, and, and try to get information before we pull it. So I would like to have you guys tell us that you're going to pull it so I don't have to worry about it instead of it just come to us. Well, so, so my only hesitation is I think there is a date in our land development code that references the maps that we use for development processes. And at a minimum, we need to change that to the June 5, 2020 maps so that we can use the updated maps. Just like you said, those mm -hmm. are much better okay. on the coast. So at a minimum, we need to do that. Now, whether we need to do <clears throat> A couple other things that the team is recommending because they will help us get us to the next level on the FEMA insurance rates, which mm -hmm. lower insurance rates for everybody in the whole county. That that's that's another discussion. So I think at a minimum, and so I need to circle back with Todd to make sure that at a minimum we 
we have to reference in our code the current maps so that we can use the current maps. And that's one of the changes that's on the agenda for the Planning Commission. So we, we can move forward with that and not do any of the rest. We could probably do that. I will say the, the team is, we need to sit down with you and walk you through it because what they're recommending is really just a couple of changes that would lower insurance rates across the, across the county. So, so at a minimum, I think we need to change the time. That's why I can't, I don't want to say because I didn't get the answer yet this morning about whether or not we, we can still do that because that, the FEMA maps become effective June 5th, 2020. If I recall from reading the draft ordinance, we actually in the LEC reference the old date of the maps. And so we need to change that date at a minimum. Okay, so, so the new date. Now we right. don't necessarily need to do anything else, but we need to at least do that. Okay, so let, let's 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 go proceed with that. But it, but it's going to be critical that we do, we do factor in not just re uh, lowering insurance rates, because you've got an area that's fully depressed, mm -hmm. and, be, and 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 I've got county uh, county attorney Jeff Steinstein taking a look at to see what are the others doing up and down the coast. You know, Hernando's got some great improvements going on. Pinellas too. We seem to be the other one struggling. Maybe the rules that we have in place, they may have saved a little bit of insurance costs for other people around the area, but if it's costing us dramatically where I've got empty buildings up and down, I got homeless up and down 19, if I can't change these demographics because of saving insurance rates, guess what? The property values are raising everybody else's property taxes. So it's something we need to look at comprehensively, not an area, and that's why I want to get this vertical stakeholder committee together to go look at everything. But if you want to make the first step of changing the date, give us the time to get repositioned, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Commissioner, that if if I may, um, it, did go, it did go to both the vertical and the horizontal roundtables. Now that doesn't mean that this can't be delayed for further, but it, just so that you you know, it it did go to both of those both of those committees. So follow up, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Steinsteiner, uh, this is Todd Bailey. For the record, it, I looked at it. It did go in the February, and it was uncontested in the vertical and the horizontal. Um, Nobody, there was no rebuttal back from it, but yet again, uh, we'll, we'll follow up your suggestion with uh, Mr. Biles. Mr. Chairman, if I could, Jack Mariano. Please go ahead. So to have a, a different vertical group, maybe, what's, what's needed. I've got a, a bunch of builders out there. I've got a um, local attorney that's, that's very concerned about this that actually t told me this was going on internally. Because again, I never saw anything about this. I don't know about anybody else. So I think it is something really to look, closely look at. And in a very short period of time, let's go get a stakeholder meeting together with some other people that I think will add some good input as far as what we need to look at and what we need to do. So with that, I'll move on to my, my next thing. Um, the Lynx Golf Course, you're going to probably see a bunch of emails. A lot of people are, are afraid of what's going on with uh, it. It's taken. That course shut down in June. We still haven't got the resolution to what to go do with the ordinance. Uh, I know Clark Hobby's worked real closely with staff to make sure that we protected the agricultural uh, side of the county or that, that have some issues out there with it. But this is definitely a, a devastating thing for this area. Um, you know, if you've had other issues that are out there between stormwater, between uh, wildlife out there, uh, just quality of life of just high grass in the backyard where it used to be a golf course. I do want to see that thing coming forward as quick as we can. Um, our county attorney just let us know that because of the advertising requirements and the, the way the Tampa Times is printing right now, we have to wait for not this coming meeting, this upcoming meeting, but the one after that. So that is something I hope you'll all closely look at and listen to the residents that are out there. Um, and let's see. I'll say um, Leisure Lane, I want to thank Mike Carbella for looking at the emergency situation that's out there and actually responding well. They're going to start doing some cleanup out there on Thursday morning, which I think will be phenomenal. And one of the great things that's coming... starting Wednesday. Is it Wednesday or Thursday? They told me Wednesday, 10 a.m. Okay. All right. I'll verify my date. Um, with, with that said, one of the things we were trying to do, go was work with DEO as we made the trip up in Tallahassee. It was kind of one of the thoughts that uh, Kevin Guthrie thought it might work at. But uh, we're going to go with the state grant uh, to try to just have a, a uh, representative Mariano is going to put in for the $1.5 million for the infrastructure to try to get that done. We think it will be a project that could be accepted. It is said to be a lot quicker going this way than it is to try to wait and go to the grant funding uh, process. So that's all I have at this point. I think uh, 
our county administrator is going to bring up another subject, but I'll let that go. But anyway, thank, I want to thank all the whole staff, the whole team for, for working through this tough times as far as communication and getting stuff done. But it is difficult times, but uh, it's great to, great to be meeting with all, you, all of you again. <coughs> Mr. Carano, we'll, we'll move on to um, Mr. Biles, please. All right, thank you. Just uh, actually, I have more than a couple things. One, I'm going to have Andy Fossa here in a second update you on what's going on uh, with respect to the, our COVID response. Uh, but first, uh, the EDC has already pushed out the notice on their social media. So, you know, feel free to take 30 seconds right now and, and reshare that to your contacts um, if you haven't already. But they have pushed that out. I saw that, and we are in the process of doing that as well. Um, second, uh, since it got brought up, you know, we have been working um, on the FEMA program that Commissioner Starkey referenced with respect to feeding more than just um, the elderly. Uh, and so if I, I'll, I'll kick it over to Kathy for a few minutes. You can kind of quickly update everybody where it's going to that while we get set up for Andy to do his discussion. So go ahead, Kathy. Good morning. It's Kathy Pearson, Assistant County Administrator, Public Services. So it's called the Coronavirus Pandemic Purchase and Distribution of Food Eligible for Public Assistance. So we just got this last week, and it is a FEMA reimbursed grant. So uh, we have been working with Chuck Anderson from the United Way, put a, uh, a whole chart together of all our food pantries. If they were to receive more funding, what they could be possibly on. Um, uh, if it was money, what they could do, and we're also going to be uh, 1230 today. We do have a conference call um, with our emergency management team and some team Check. members to discuss how we can include restaurants and maybe further this uh, information. So we're at very early stages, but we're working on it. Thank you. But, but before you, no, wait, hold on, please. Can everybody give me a favor and just a reminder to mute your microphones there's a lot of rustling going on in side conversations which we're starting um yeah so uh okay so you're working with united way what about metropolitan ministries and um would would you metropolitan be under united way or um, exactly so they yes commissioner starkey they are on the list that united way provided from metropolitan ministries there was volunteer way very several of the food pantry, so Metro Ministries was in there. Also, one community now. Great. I think this is so good for our local restaurants uh, to be able to get involved in this. So, how how will we let the local restaurants know that this is another program? So, Commissioner Starkey, we're just we're just working on this right now. So, we have not finalized all the details. We're still trying to work with FEMA on exactly what we can and what we can't do. So, that was at twelve thirty call. Okay, great. I'm so excited about this. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Kathy. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Chief Andy Fossa, uh, Director of Emergency Management. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, brief update on what's going on in the EOC and statewide. Um, currently, the numbers you see up there are 202 and 7. It is now 211 and 7. I got the no, recent update. 204 and 7. 211 total. 211 total. 204 and 7. Sorry. So um, we are working still with EM. We are still stood up at a level two. Um, our logistics and our finance sections are working internally. Uh, we are getting supplies in uh, by private providers. Um, I mean, by private vendors. However, uh, we're still running into that issue of uh, people saying they need PPE, long-term facilities, healthcare, uh, nursing homes. And then when we call them to come get them, they are not coming to pick them up. And we recall repeatedly. So uh, yesterday, uh, Monday, I gave the directive to my logistics staging area. You give them one more call. If it's non-responsive within 24 hours, the supplies go back into the queue and we push it out to facilities that are actually in need of it. So we have, we have not had that issue yet, but we still have orders sitting there. <clears throat> On another note, um, and I briefed, uh, Chairman Moore on it, and I did get a chance to talk to Commissioner Starkey. Um, Pinellas County is now pushing patients up into up into Pasco. Ooh. We had a nursing home down in uh, Pinellas County, St. Mark's. Uh, they're one of our target facilities with the Region 4-6 uh, IMT team going down there. 
and they had an outbreak there with approximately, I think it was 16 total COVID-19 positive patients. This morning, I get a phone call from the medical center, or last night, I got an emergency resource request from the medical center, uh, Trinity Medical Center, and they were asking for PPEs, and I inquired as to why, and they said, we just received five patients from Pinellas County. So we talk about surge, we, we talk about the, the positives and trending. Um, right now, we're on a flat line. We are basically getting the same amount of patients every day. So we're, we plateaued, we're flat, we're hoping to start going downward here within the next couple of weeks. However, our surge is gonna come from our nursing home facilities and they're gonna be um, coming in numbers. Pasco County has been very good. We have one facility that has two positive and we have another one that has a PUI in it. Um, and they were tested and hopefully we'll get a response back on that. So we're in pretty good shape. My concerns are these outlying counties wanting to push patients up into Pasco County. Because in the event we get a surge within our nursing homes, we're gonna run into problems. Out of 100, I think it's 110 um, ICU beds that we have, we currently have, what was that number, Dan? 40. About 40 in ICU. So if we start receiving patients from other facilities, and, and, and the bad thing about it is, DOH and EM on the Pasco side is not aware of this. This is DOH on the Pinellas County side <clears throat> that's making these arrangements and the healthcare facilities themselves making arrangements with whoever they can get a hold of to put patients in. There's been some very, very big discussions on the state level uh, with my Region 46 IMT team. We're seeing over seeing 18 counties with this. And there's a very, very big discussion down in Pinellas County on what they need to do. And it ranged from um, the um, Summersville nursing home that was closed down, that not closed down, that was evacuated, turning that into a COVID-19 facility for all of Pinellas County that has patients, opening up alternative care sites. So during these discussions and listening in on them, there is no definitive plan because we do not know what's going to happen. So I have talked with Catherine Perkins, the uh, Pinellas County EM director, and I kind of laid it on her feet that, hey, we're getting your patients. I am not going to continue to use my PPEs to fund this. You guys need to start giving us your PPEs because your citizens are in my facilities now. So she's reaching out to see how much PPE they have. Uh, so hopefully we'll get an answer back. The state is aware of what happened. Um, unfortunately, they have, they, they really cannot do anything about it. Um, I, we have, I have spoken with the Surgeon General. They have reached out to us. We have reached out to them. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a long road. Um, we are working on our Reopen America campaign. Uh, our checklist is done um, and, and completed. We're just waiting to do some final tweaks on it. So the day the governor says, open the doors, uh, Administrator Biles can say, here, the plan is in place, we're going to open the doors. There are some questions that we have, um, and the biggest one is social distancing. I think that's going to be very hard to maintain because, we're, like we said, we already, we already see congregations going on and groups of people still meeting up, and I think that's going to be one of our downfalls. Um, testing is not going to be a downfall for us because I have the 3,500 rapid testing kits coming in. Uh, we have an order in for another 5,000, so that should cover county workers, healthcare facilities, first responders, and everybody that needs to be tested. Um, we are setting up protocols for when you come to work, there's going to be like we have right now in the EOC. You're going to be questioned a certain amount of questions. You're going to be have your temperature swab. The first thing you're going to do is walk in the bathroom, wash your hands. You're going to walk outside. We're going to you're going to get squirted with some hand sanitizer, and you're going to clean your hands. Um, with that, I really don't have any other fill-ins. I know we're still operating under the executive order 90, 2091 from the uh, governor. And under that, it, it offshoots and recognizes that Miami-Dade uh, emergency order that was put out. I, I just wanna caution us that if we are doing a slow start and these parks or start, trails are starting to get open and you're looking at SunWest Mine and, and, and these beaches, um, we got to be very careful with this because the executive order on one side reflects one thing, and I know we, he has the ability to alter that a little bit. 
but we need to have plans in place to maintain social distancing. There has to be people there to maintain that because the last thing we need to do is get groups of people together again and then start a research. And I'm afraid I don't want that to happen. So with that, sir. All right. Commissioner Starkey. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, you know, we have taken steps in our county to uh, have overflow sites if we needed them with the hotels and did Pinellas County not set up any overflow sites within their own county? <clears throat> it's not that they didn't, they did, <clears throat> excuse me, they do not have the staff to do it. If a mission like this was to open up and a surge was to really occur, I would say 75% of the counties would be dependent on the state's assistance. It's not that they can't open them up, it's they don't have the personnel or the staffing. Um, currently right now, I have in my EOC, every morning I have 40 nurses in there. And every day I have sites that they're going out to and they're doing infection protocol assessments, they're doing PPE assessments, they're doing actual testing on patients in Pinellas, Pasco, um, all the way down to Sarasota. Their staffing augmentation, they're not allowed to do clinical care. They cannot augment staff. They cannot go in there. Some of these uh, agencies cannot. To try to hire these staffs with the state gobbling them all up, it, there, there's not going to be that ability. Maybe a small one with DOH assistance, but you're not going to be able to open a big, big site. You got to remember, Pinellas County has over 253 facilities. That's not including the hospital. And Paso County, we're very fortunate. I think we have 153, but we're very fortunate because our DOH and EM work in conjunction with these facilities consistently, and they know proper PPE donning and doffing. They know infection control policies. We're seeing these other places in these other counties <clears throat> are not practicing what they preach. So that's why we're seeing these outbreaks happen. Pasco County, we're very fortunate. So, and, and we will work with Pinellas if we have to, but I just wanna let you guys know that this is occurring and what EM is reaching out back to that county to have them supply resources to us. So um, I did give you a resource and I see he, he told me he emailed you yesterday and I, I sent it on yep. to you, Dan and Scott Casson of, of a place for more PPE, although it takes a little while to get some of that in. So if we're gonna use it, we need to jump on it. But um, I agree with you that a, a, a common sense place in Pinellas County is to take the uh, closed up one. I think it's um, Freedom, Freedom. It's, it's um, I, I keep want to call it Summersville. It's, it's got a different uh, name. Freedom. I can't off the top freedom of my head. Something. Um, Free, freedom Square is still open. Yeah. In fact, oh. I, have a, I have a team in there today. And in fact, I have a, they call them PHS teams. They are federal teams from the state and they actually contain nurses, doctors, and respiratory therapists because they had a large, they're having a large outbreak in there. So I sent that team down there to work with that facility and their medical director to um, hopefully in, in, to institute some new protocols. And it's, it's very easy things that these, these places are missing. A lot of facilities do not use hand sanitizer, well, not, not use hand sanitizer. Their hand sanitizer contains no alcohol in it. So it's not gonna do boo when you go up there and wash your hands for the coronavirus. So hand washing techniques is, is one big thing. Some of the nursing staff in some facilities don't even wear PPE. They just walk in a patient's room, they walk out and go into another patient's room without even washing. So these are the ways and the avenues this virus is spreading in these facilities. Well, I, I think that uh, they should be able to um, open up a wing down there, like you said, we do up here and put those um, uh, PP, those infected citizens in those wings. Now, I, I want to help my my neighboring counties, but it seems that they need to just be a little bit more responsible before they start sending them up here. Yes, ma'am, and that's and that and that's the talks that they're having down there now. Okay, I know they have a board meeting uh, this afternoon at two. Pinellas County does. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Chairman? Jack Mariano, please go ahead. Um, you know, I think it's going to be critical. We kind of control all the Hills Road traffic and Pinellas traffic coming up here. Uh, what you're dealing with now is a, is a special situation as well. I think Pasco County has done a phenomenal job with the social distancing. When I look, when I go to Publix Market, which is, I went there once 
and then like three, for three weeks hadn't been. And the way they had marked off the plexiglasses out there, some of our retail places out there are doing the same type of thing. Home Depot's got a great line where they're limiting the amount of people going in. So I think we've done a phenomenal job getting the word out um, and the people have responded tremendously, the businesses too. So hopefully they'll follow. You had made a comment about the number of kits you've got, uh, about 5,000 or so, or enough to- We're getting 3,500 uh, rapid test kits in. All right. I, 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 want, I would like to see you just increase that because if we were going to have, you want to make this available for the private sector as well, like publics or whatever, if they, and then by the way, the publics folks are now wearing masks as well, which is fantastic. All their cashiers, et cetera, they're walking around with it. Everybody's protecting themselves. I want to make sure we have enough PPE for everybody, every retail. As we go forward to trying to look at, you know, are we going to be starting to open up, which I see some places are for a uh, barber shop going in, uh, for a sauna, uh, Mm -hmm. hair, hair salon, et cetera, those, those places of retail have it out there so that they can get it if they need it for their employees so they don't get stuck in a situation where they don't have it. Yes, we want to let them protect themselves every step of the way. Um, you know, my wife wanted to go to Trader Joe's to get some organic stuff at good price. And I said, you're not going on to Hillsborough County. I said, we're going to have to find it here and get it here in Pasco and, and go. Hopefully we'll get to Trader Joe's it. soon. You want market? Okay. Um, so, um having said that i'll let, let it go on and i have a couple more slides too so but i think that's it for andy as he mentioned we are looking i know the governor and his task force are working up a plan for the state we're, we're kind of looking at the what the president of the white house put out just because we kind of think that'll be the foundation if you will of the governor's plan so we kind of want to make sure we understand what that means and then we will do what the governor rolls out uh, later this week with this task force uh, with respect to the near the end, so keep going. There we go. Yeah. So, um, but we are working, you know, across the enterprise uh, phased openings of some of our currently closed facilities. Um, we've been working a plan, actually, probably for more than a week, about the right way to open up and allow. You know, Pasco residents to use our wilderness, nature parks, our preserved parks for recreation, or not for recre for exercising, trail riding, those kinds of things. Uh, so those um, those we're prepared to open tomorrow. Um, as part of that, though, the the things like playgrounds, pavilions, restrooms inside those parks will stay closed. Again, part of that is to encourage someone to go use it, but not to use it for eight hours. Use it for a 30 minute, a one hour or two hour bike ride and then and then go home or to wherever. So, but not to use it for an eight hour event and to be a single use or small group use, not big gatherings at those places. We have built plans for opening SunWest um, and you know we think there is a way to do that. And uh, the SunWest Park, um, Hudson Park is one too that could be on the list. And again, that one actually impacts some small businesses uh, and so having that available to the people that go visit those small businesses down there, the restaurants and stuff uh, would, would help those small businesses out. And that's why we thought of that one too, as opposed to a couple of our other places. So, um, you know, right now the plan is uh, tomorrow to open up those wilderness and nature preserve parks. Again, our, our parks team will be watching for the social distancing, but there will be most of the facilities where people would gather aren't going to be open. You're not going to be able to gather there. So, the intent there is to come in, ride your bike, whatever, and then, or walk or do whatever and, and, um, and, and go home. Uh, the other thing is we will, we were working a plan, some signage um, and coordination with a couple other agencies to reopen the residential bulk drop off again. And I think that the plan is to have that open for the weekend. And so those were kind of the main ones. We're building a plan to reopen libraries in phases. I'll take a little longer because those typically do have gatherings in them with tables and stuff like that. And so that will probably wait until we see what the governor says on Friday and see what kind of timeline we would build up for that. As you notice, they are at libraries is doing a lot of work. They just don't necessarily have the door open to circulate books uh, right now, but you can get a lot of electronic stuff from the libraries as well too. So um that's the plan from an operations perspective uh like i said the sunwest park plan uh, could open tomorrow too um you know part of this is 
getting a little feedback on that. And then so Hudson as well could be available. Hudson, the, again, the, both of them, SunWest is easy to control. We have a gate. It's easy to make sure somebody has an annual pass. The plan was to open it for annual pass holders only and to limit it to 75 cars. Then that way, because I think we can park close to 250 or 300 cars in there, it's easy to maintain the distance in the park if you only have about that many people in it, and we would open the restroom there. Um, again, Hudson, that's really something to help benefit the small businesses that are down there and that are struggling right now. And we've been trying to work any way we can, as you just approved the grant program, to help our small businesses through this so that they can be ready to, we can get Pasco back up and running as fast as possible on the back end of this. So, um, and I have another slide that's really more geared to revenue. Um, and so I don't know if you want to talk about uh, Sun West and Hudson now, uh, Chair, or if you would like me to go on to the revenue piece, and then we come back to that. I'm, I can go either way. Well, I, I think it is a discussion that needs to ha be happen now. Um, as you mentioned, um, both of you mentioned that we're looking to see, obviously, what the governor is doing. The task force just started meeting yesterday at 2 o'clock. was the first call. I was actually on the phone with Senator Simpson. He had to jump off and, and uh, jump on that call. Um, you know, we want to see things opening, obviously, in the future. Um, but you're talking about a, I'm throwing this out there. I'll let anybody else jump in. But um, you're talking about a peak type situation. Um, and, uh, you know, what concerns me is we would have park staff having to police that. And um, I never would ever want to put our park staff or teams in any type of jeopardy. Um, they're not, and at the same time, I don't want to put the sheriff's office deputies in jeopardy either, having the possibility of large groups at this time until we know what, how we should move forward. Um, this task force started yesterday. <laughs> we, I think we need to give it a few, give them a few days uh, to start giving some direction. So, I mean, you know, better safe than, you know, better safe than sorry. I, I did. I, I, I'm really, 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 really worried about our staff, our park staff, having to take on a role of police. That's not their job. You know, I mean, we, we you know, one of the situations we run into before was that they were trying to, um, you know, well, let me jump in here too. So if you open a couple, well, the question is going to be, why aren't you opening everything? I'll let Commissioner Stark, I see your hand up. I'll let you jump in. Yeah, well, I've been getting a lot of calls about Starkey Wilderness Park, and I think it can very easily be opened um, for trail riders and um, off-road riders and hikers. Um, just close the day use part, keep the bathrooms closed, have them park at the Science Center, the kiosk, and off-road and hikers can park over at the horse corral. So um, I think it can be done very easily. I, I kind of think that I think the sheriff's office should drive in there and drive drive around every now and then. I think that's part of the role <clears throat> play in our community. So um, um, I, I want to see these parks open up. I don't know the makeup of all the parks as well. I you know um, I I see how Sun West could. I think that's a good idea to limit the amount of cars that come in, um, but. Our citizens want to be able to get outside and get some fresh air, and um, and I think there are some parks that we can start opening in this rollout. Yeah, so I don't I don't disagree I don't disagree about your trails you're talking about. Obviously, you can practice social distancing when you're riding bikes and you're walking. We do that in all the neighborhoods. Um, so I, I see that. I'm just worried about a situation where you have mass large amounts of people congregating right now before we've had direction. Um, you know, from the state and from the governor's office with this task force and giving well, those recommendations. So I would have had those parks open. I wouldn't have shut some of those parks. I would have just made it so that you couldn't use the kiosks. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, apparently we had some people having birthday parties in the, uh, what are the, the covered areas and, and a lot of people had a playground. I, I would have closed those. I, I would have left open the, uh, trails. So again, it's it's a matter of what the facilities are in the different parks and how easily people can be recreating in a socially distant 
way. Um, and that's the, that is, I think, the logistics of each park site, how easily it can be done. Not all parks can operate that way, but I think some can. Well, I'm going to- Chairman Jack Mariano? Yeah, we'll keep going. I mean, Please I want to- Key Vista talk. Park. Key what Vista happened? Park should be open. Okay, I'm not, okay. Um, let me go ahead with Commissioner Mariano. Uh, and I'd say the, the more that you actually open, the more you're going to spread out the opportunities to go. Um, as far as the SunWest Park goes, you've got a gate control that's right there. Uh, the parking lot, that's just the asphalt part that holds 250. There's another park to this parking lot to the side that's dirt still that's, that can hold 600. When that park fills up with the first 250, it's still got plenty of room in it. I understand how we want to start slow, so I'm okay with just starting with the 75 and going from that, but I'd, I'd give the administrative flexibility to look at it day to day, see how it goes. But you're gonna have people, all that's gonna happen out there, if you can't get in at that number, at those numbers, there's just gonna be a line outside waiting for other people to leave. I mean, there was a, there was a line at Home Depot uh, picking up some supplies yesterday that goes in and around the whole building and people just wait, they keep their distance and go. And there was a couple of, couple of funny, a guy, guy, couple of guys in front of us were like getting close to another guy that was, to him and he said, hey, back off six feet. And I called them the violators. But uh, I mean, people are paying attention. People don't wanna get sick. I think they're watching it. This is an asset we have. And back to SunWest again, let them go buy the pass, that annual fee. It'll show up on the screen. So when they come in to check in, make them show the driver's license, they'll see the pass, they can get in. And then they just work the social, social distancing. I don't think there's an issue whatsoever with our staff out there, um, you know, work working that through. And I think, I. I think Commissioner Stark is right. People need to get out there and recreate. And we're in we're in pretty good shape. We just gotta, you know, take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I don't dis again, I I said I agree about the the bike, the bike paths and the jogging trails and the walking trails. Um, you're not congregating there. I'm again, I just uh, Commissioner Wells, Oakley, I can't see hands, so no, thanks, Chairman. I I don't have any issues with it. I mean, I personally have heard from a lot of people with Starkey, and I know one of the reasons we decided to close it was because of folks coming from other counties, spitting on one of our employees. I mean, our employees just need to understand that we're not going to tolerate that. It's a felon. You need to let the sheriff's office know. But I know Sheriff Nako's team's done a good job with the boat ramps, you know, driving in and out, making sure folks are social distancing, which worked out well. But I'm with you, Commissioner Moore. I think we all it's about our employees and about the residents. We wanna make sure they feel safe at their job, but I think we can do that. Um, with the bathrooms, that's another thing, Dan. I don't know, what's the, isn't it like you have to clean them every half hour? I mean, it's, should we just close them all together? That way. The, 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 so the, if the wilderness parks, um, the nature preserves, the bathrooms will stay closed. So the only place we would open a bathroom would have been at Sun West because that's where we were gonna have people for longer part of the intent there was to encourage people to come do their workout or whatever and then leave or do their walk and then leave not to stick around for eight hours so that's that was the intent to close the pavilions close the playground close the bathrooms uh, they're all closed today but to keep them closed and the trails and and those things are available then well and keith's, so, keith's done a good job i know there's been folks that park out front have been riding their bikes and then our team is right. okay with that. So, I mean, we're kind of doing it, but I just, I do worry about the amount of people. Mm -hmm. It might be something where we limit the amount that just until we make sure the social distancing happening, but I, but I kind of agree folks need to get out of the house. They want to go walking with their family or riding and we, you know, or swimming or whatever. So. Mr. Oakley, you have anything, sir? I agree with what Charles was talking about. I've been listening to you, so um, I'm a bad. Uh, slow opening is is good. That's better than what we've had. So I'm good when it comes time, but still got to social dis distance ourselves from from others. Can't get others can't get opening it up too much because you don't want it to start right back up again, and then you end up having to close. Don't want to do that? Have to close again. I think we got it going in the right direction. So let me let me jump in one more time again. You know, I think we all agree about the trails. I think we're all in agreement about the trails and the walking paths and stuff. Again, concern being the beach at the time is on the line is in the office. What? Keith Wiley, are you out there? 
Keith on I don't think he's on the line, sir. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, he was an attendee motive. I, I believe he is. I believe he is on the line. I think he needs to be on the line, but. Yeah, we just did. Yep. Okay. I'm here, Commissioner. Okay. So let, let me just ask you this. Um, you know, I, you feel confident about the trails that can be managed and walking. I, again, I see that. I mean, by people walking in my neighborhood every day, I've seen people walking that I never even knew lived here, which is great. <laughs> They're outside. But what is your feeling about your staff in situations where you may have larger you know, people congregating, i.e. a beach area at this time? Well, yeah. How would that be managed? How does your staff feel that they can manage that? So for the Sun West plan, what we did was, and it's already been discussed, we, we opted to restrict the number of vehicles through the, through the main gate. Uh, in hopes that, uh, you know, basically if you allow 75 cars in, there's enough space, open space there to allow individual users to spread out. Um, at which point we, we also put in the plan to increase the staffing there to, to kind of, you know, help educate on social distancing. Uh, I, you know, I, I do think that, that that is a concern of the teams. It's a concern of mine. Um, but again, the park, you know, is gated. Um, does have a boundary. Um, I do agree there could be a concern in, in terms of cars backing up at the gate. We've discussed that. The teams discussed that. Um, no different than the than cars park uh, backing up. I guess at the boat ramps on a Saturday and you know, on a busy weekend. So um, I, I think that at the end of the day, the wilderness parks, the nature parks, the Elan preserves definitely lend themselves towards um, being able to practice social distancing. I think the team will have a greater challenge uh, at the at both Strickland Park and Sun West to control that. But again, that's where signage and, and education comes into play uh, and hoping that the community does their part. Okay, since we have Keith on the line, does anybody have any questions for Keith? Nobody? Yeah. So, so listen to the, all that um, would then, I think what I heard was the, the eight or so, and I may be off a number two, uh, nature parks, preserves, Elam you know, preserves, the board is okay with us opening those to to the bikers, the exercise workers, in the manner we talked about. Um, and then I heard clearly on Sun West. I think if, if I can summarize, I think I heard um, in general. Let's kind of see what the governor's task force says, and, and then and then uh, reconsider that maybe on on Friday when we hear from them. Um, and, and, and kind of see, I, I'm just just trying to figure out because I don't I don't want I don't think we want to wait if if things continue to go the way they're going and then on Friday the governor's task force comes out with the thing to to yes we think you should start opening these types of facilities I'm not sure I don't think we want any of us want to wait until the fifth to open those facilities which would be the next board meeting so I'm trying to make sure that what the plan that Keith's team works on is consistent with kind of the board's thought process right now. Um, and, and I think I very clearly heard wilderness parks, nature preserves, trails, those things, yes. Open those for the limited groups we've been talking about. Um, I think the discussion was a little grayer with respect to the timing on SunWest uh, and then, then uh, Strickland. So um, just trying to make sure I understand as we go away from here today, and, and I appreciate the discussion because uh, it helps give us guidance over the next two weeks how to do that. I just want to make sure we understand um, kind of what the board's consensus is with respect to SunWest and then Strickland and ultimately, obviously, the other uh, uh, facilities along the coast. Because we would like to be proactive with respect to what the governor says on Friday and you know maybe take it up even further if things go well over the next week or so with even more facilities uh, throughout the county. So. We're trying to phase this in, starting now with the wilderness parks, and we built the plan for Hudson, Strickland, and Sun West. I just want to make sure I understand what the board 
desire, desire for us kind of guidance, if you will, is on SunWest and Strickland. Mr. Chairman, Judge <laughs> Adams. Commissioner Mayor, yeah, yeah. if I could, with, with, with SunWest, it is, as Keith says, it's a gated community, it's a gated access to it. We've got passes that need to be bought uh, if people come in, if, is, is my recommendation. And I know the staff's going the same way. Uh, this way here, they, they have the placard that's on there. They can actually see it coming in. They can show a license coming in, showing they're from Pasco County. At 75 cars, when again, that whole left side that's paved asphalt can hold 250. Dan, I just sent you a couple of pictures from the day we closed the park right. and how light it was when I told everybody the light traffic was out there. Obviously, we're going to see more traffic. You'll, you'll fill up those 75 cars. There's no doubt in my mind. I, I strongly think that you could actually get the 250 cars that would be in there, but I'm comfortable starting with the 75. Let it build up and let's see how it goes because I think every car that comes in is going to be full. So that may just make it like that 75 is more like 150 anyway. But let staff go take a look at it. Let them work through it. People are going to distance themselves. They don't want to do this. And we've seen this over and over in Pasco County. And these are only Pasco County residents that are looking for a place to go. Uh, as far as the, the Hudson Beach, Strickland Beach, um, that park there, I don't think, Dan, we're even allowing swimming yet anyway. No, we, the DEP is not testing, so we couldn't swim there. So anymore. you're not going to swim there anyway, but you're going to allow, allow people to, when they do go to the restaurants that are out in the water, they can go buy it, they can go in the pavilions. They kept their distance over the weekend on Sunday. Uh, they actually helped the business quite a bit. They actually had more sales Sunday than they did Friday and Saturday, but they still kept the social distancing. People are smart enough. They don't want to take any chances. I've got a, um, my, my dad doesn't even go anywhere right now because he doesn't want to take a chance on getting sick. I don't think you're going to come, come into that situation. I think people are paying attention. Let the people enjoy themselves a little bit. The more options that are out there, the safer we are. And these are two that can be controlled. And I'm sure the restaurant folks will actually keep an eye on Strickland Beach as well if need be to say, hey, make sure you keep social distancing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Please go ahead, Commissioner Rockley. Uh, Mr. Miles, I was wondering, I'm okay with the slow opening of what we're talking about here right now, and, and I don't have any problem. Do you have a list or what might come next? Because I don't know. We're not meeting to May 5th. Do you have to wait on the board to be able to no, react sir. to the issue? No, sir. Uh, we would, I mean, we close them under the local state of emergency. We can. You know, if the governor on Friday says this is the way we think you ought to phase in those those facilities, we can take his recommendation and build a plan for for our parks, facilities, and libraries and other things. And so, you know, we would just use a local state of emergency to do that. And so, what I was really getting trying to get today is I think I got consensus on the nature parks, preserves, et cetera. Try sure. to figure out where the board's collective thought processes are with respect to SunWest and, and Strickland, because those are the really, probably the ones that are probably a little more uh, debatable, if you will, uh, from that perspective. And, and if you'd like, we can wait on those two until Friday. And if the governor's recommendation from his task force says, hey, those kinds of facilities you should open with social distancing and all the other, then, then we can roll that out over the weekend. So I, I think there's a way to do that too. So yeah, I'm just trying to, that Keith and I understand what the board would like to see done. Right. I don't have a problem with opening those up a little early than the weekend. And if the weekend allows you to open up some other parks, the problem is if you go and open them up all at one time and our neighboring counties decide they love our parks better than theirs, it creates that issue that we don't want. So we got to make sure we have that social. Well, and, and that's, that's why we were only open the wilderness and nature preserves. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Commissioner Starkey. Um, do we, and I, and I just got a text, maybe we're going to know it uh, on Friday, but do we have any idea, um, and maybe Keith might know, if the state's going to open up places like Ancloak Key and the Sandbar, um, this, and then we have with Lacoochee State Park, and we have our our other state park, the uh, Werner Boyce. I mean, to have that closed is kind of, I think it's a little, I think we could open Werner Boyce and not have a problem, but do we know anything about state parks? 
So, Commissioner, this is Keith Wiley. Um, as of right now, I we do not have that information. I would assume that if something comes out of the governor's uh, task force, that the state park system would be mentioned. That would be our hope. All right. I, I know 10 people on that task force, so I might give them my opinion. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm just going to throw it out there one more time. Again, I, I'm in agreement with, you know, the nature parks and stuff. My concern still being is that you're going to, um, with not a order to open up beaches um, from the governor's office and or task force, we're going to be in a situation at um, SunWest where, again, our park staff is going to be having to police that park and potentially run into issues. I, that concerns me. I, again, I, I'm just telling you, I'm 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 concerned about our 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 uh, our team members out there and what they might run into. That's me. But there's not consensus there. You, then there's not consensus. But I don't know what it will hurt to wait like four four days. Because it opens up again. Remember <clears throat> what you're what you have a situation. <clears throat> that was one of the concerns when um, we did close the beaches, is that the masses would come to this area. I see you're saying about, again, letting pass holders, I understand that. Um, at, at the same time, yeah, but I, I don't, I, are you having problems here? Um, I, with the other ones not being open, I just see a mass influx. And do you really want people sitting out there in line for hours on end waiting, waiting to get in somewhere? You think they're all gonna stay in the car? All right, Chairman. I'll leave it on you guys. Chairman, Commissioner Wells. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, I, I trust Dan and, and Keith, whatever they think, but I don't know that 75 cars should be it. It probably should be people. Um, I don't know if we can keep a head count. And, you know, one thing I can tell you, like Home Depot's got a head count. I've been going there because Lowe's doesn't, and it's two packed. I don't feel comfortable going down aisles just being honest and lowe's is doing a lot to help this veteran too so it but i again i understand what commissioner moore is saying I, I think i like the idea of opening it but maybe it is you know i think we keep cool. track of who goes in maybe it's the amount of people not well we i'll keep i'll take this feedback back and we'll circle back on sun west and in in strickland we will move forward with the nature preserves and when we come put a little more meat on and if you will, for some Western Strickland, and then get that out to you, so you can kind of see that, see what see what you think, and then um, you know we can circle back with you individually over the next couple three days, and then maybe on Friday, uh, if the governor's order or well recommendation that comes out of task force, maybe that can give us a little more guidance on those two. Um, I, you know, I think they both have two different. Points, you know, the, the Strickland one is trying to help the small businesses that they're down there at the end of the road there too, and SunWest is a, just a, a place to be able to go out and relax, and we don't have a lot of those right now. Well, so, hey, let me jump in. If you're saying Strickland, and I think Commissioner Mario mentioned this, and then you um, confirmed it, if the beach itself and you can't swim and there's actually closed, then you're not going to have that issue. So I don't have an issue with right. Strickland. Okay. Yeah, and it, it, we would have to post the beach closed because there's been no testing out there, and that is one that we pretty routinely have to close the swimming because of the testing and uh, yeah. what's in the canal or in the water there. Yeah, if it's just so. some of the people going to the restaurants and walking down to see the sunset and they're staying away, they're not going to be a mass crowd there because they're not swimming. I get that. That's fine. Okay. I mean, it's just like, you know, me walking down the street and watching the sunset at the pond in my neighborhood, right? Right. Um, yes, sir. But again, the other thing, the beach thing, again, you know, you, you go back, and the last point I'll make on this, is that when you have the large beaches, beaches there's uh, there's not people having to quote police that area. There's not park people from parks um, having to go up and down and talk to every one of those individuals. So that's again back to what it's open. It's open, but if you have to sit there and manage it and police it, that's again having these people in close contact with each other. That's what our team would have to do. So that's my last point on so, that. So, 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 um, so, 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 Chairman Jack Moran, if I could. Okay. Um, first, Starkey, just said, first. Starkey race first. I'll try. Um, sorry, sorry. Danny, um, it, it kind of brought up a, a, a you're speaking at, brought up a thought. So if the governor is, is going to release his ideas, uh, recommendations on Friday, 
Is this something that you administratively um, can adopt, pick and choose from his recommendations, or is that something that you come back to the commissioners on? Or no, no ma'am, we we can go off his recommendations and move forward. Uh, we don't need to wait till the fifth. Okay, so um, and and then I heard Commissioner Oakley say we we're not meeting on the fifth, so that concerned me. But we are going to meet on the fifth. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. It's another meeting like this one. Except we're going to have public hearings on the fifth in the in afternoon. the afternoon. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep. Okay. Those are my I, two I questions. Didn't say we were not okay. meeting on the fifth. I, I knew we were meeting on the fifth, but I, my concern was if we had to wait to the fifth to make the decision on on moving forward. And he answered that by saying they could do it under emergency order. So I understand that. Yes, sir. Commissioner Mariana. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the picture that's on the screen right there, that was the day at about 12, 15 or so, right before we're gonna have our meeting that I heard that we're gonna go close the beach. You can't quite see it all, but the parking lot on the top row, now there's 250 car spots there, is full and there's cars to the back. That's how distance everybody is. And that's probably the most prolific area as far as where traffic is, because that's right where the water fountain is, kind of where the start of the wakeboarding is, and it goes all the way down there. So if you look at the distancing that's there, that's probably about 75 cars right now. When I tell you we've got three quarters of a mile of beach around there, and there's probably at least two thirds of a mile for what, what's got the white sand on it, you've got plenty of distance that's out there. I trust the staff to go take a look at it. Let them start with the 75 cars, let them go from there and let them go do, make the judgment as it goes day to day, they, they'll communicate. I don't think you're putting the staff in any damage whatsoever. They don't even have to, have to talk to a person coming in if they see their pass and show their ID through the window. There's no communication. The distancing will happen by itself. And it's, it's really not an issue out there. If, it, if I thought for a second our staff was in any type of danger, any type of control, I would back off it. It's not, it's gonna be good for our people to get out there and have a chance to go. Please look at that picture that I showed you. It's really not a big deal. There's plenty of room that's out there. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'll go on to the, I'll be quick on the last slide. So, so the last slide, just, uh, you know, budget has been working projections of the revenue impacts from uh, COVID to various funds. And I just wanted to, these are, you know, six month impacts at the end of the fiscal year on your currently adopted budget. Um, in, in on the general fund, that's not the entire general fund budget. That's just the projection from where we would be losing money. So it's really the sales tax and some of the other incremental things that are in the general fund piece. Uh, the, the key number there is these are probably these are the planning factors we're using um, with respect to the end of the year as to how do we pull back, if you will, expenses so that we can manage to not overspend uh, our revenue over the next six months. And so just wanted to make you aware of that. I'm not that concerned in building since we won't run a pretty healthy fund balance there. I'm very concerned in tourism. Uh, we need to make sure we're continuing to have a robust marketing plan as we come out of this to try to get that thing turned around as quickly as we can and get people back into our hotels. And so I don't want to take that too far down. The two gas, the transportation trust fund, that's, you know, public works. That's the transportation capital budget and um, some transit dollars from there. And then of course, local option gas taxes, you know, public works maintenance. And so we are working internally. Um, you know, I've asked for the various departments that are impacted to this to kind of get me a plan by the end of the week. And so I can kind of evaluate it and see that we're going to be okay here. I just wanted to make you aware that this is where we are. I, I don't think I need your blessing to not spend money. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we will probably have a further discussion on the fifth is what our plans are. Uh, but as we sit today, I, I believe we can manage these with restricting, you know, BPIs that haven't been executed yet for the fiscal year. Um, being smart with our hiring uh, processes and only in and not necessarily hiring every vacancy we have right now deferring some of our larger expenses uh, at least until we see where our revenue is going to really come in um and that's as little as you know a standard you know hvac replacement complete replacement stuff just make sure we know where our, our revenue coming in um and and so those are kind of the the top three if you will then there's another 
two or three on the list before I would ever get to start furloughing and laying people off. That's the last thing we want to do here because in six months, 12 months, I'm going to need those people again because we're going to be back open for business running full blast. So, you know, protecting the, the employees as we go through that is, is a high priority for me. Uh, and so we will build a plan and that will probably be the last, not, it's always got to be an option, but that is the last thing we want to do because in 12 to 18 months, I'm going to need them back here again. And if I let them go, I'm not going to be able to get them back. And so I just want to make you aware of my thought process as we work through this over the next couple of weeks, we will start seeing some of the sales tax data later this week. I will say that is for March. I'm not sure it's going to show the full impact because it wasn't until about halfway through March that we started to see some of the impact and people started to, to change their change their behavior. So again, this is more for your information. I kind of wanted to walk you through my thought process and what my plan is as we go through here. And I expect by the fifth to have a little more robust uh, meat on the bones, if you will, in the different funds about what we actually aren't going to probably do for the next six months uh, to, to discuss. So that's, that's just more for your information than anything else. Um, with that, I'm done, Sheriff. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. You got to keep going. We got to move on here, guys, in a minute. We're at an hour and 15 minutes past time. Um, Dan and, and uh, board members, um, I, I participated in the horizontal round table, whatever meeting. And I wanted you to know it was interesting that our planning director said that they have not seen a slowdown in pre apps. Correct. Uh, so, no slowdown um, in business development and, business and, in Pasco County. And, well, and, yes, yes, comma. Building single family homes in March was 422 single family home permits, which is a, a nice big number. I don't know how many of those were on autopilot, if you will before this started really so we don't know yet ma'am we, we got to watch april and may to see what's going on there yeah so. well i i understand that some of our online permitting um won't be ready in the in the home building part until end of the month so probably um even just logistically some of that couldn't occur like yeah. these. Yeah. so is that correct Mr. chairman jack mariano yeah, go ahead. Just want to give Commissioner Stark a quick update. The cleanup at Leisure Lane is going to be on Thursday, yeah, 7 o'clock. And then uh, on Key Vista, it is on the desk at the Deputy, Deputy Secretary at the Treasury to get signed. So hopefully that happens real quick. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. This, is, uh, this is Todd Bailey, Interim Acting County Administrator for Development Services. We have not slowed down taking plans. Um, some of the inspections have slowed down to about 800 a day in lieu of a thousand. We're still receiving paper plans on May 8th. We're going to be receiving everything electronic from start to finish in a new electronic work. That's the distinction there. We just, the business is still going strong the same way, irregardless of paper electronic. Hey, Todd, um, I just want you to know that I have uh, heard nothing but accolades on the job you're doing. Yeah. Mr. Piles, do you have anything else for us this time? No, sir. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the um, clerk's office, please. Oh, no, county, oh, sorry, county attorney's office. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I want to I want to thank the members of my team. Um, I know several of you have reached out to individual attorneys. We have not always had the answers you wanted because the court system is closed or there are other reasons why we can't effectuate, especially things like enforcement right now. Uh, but generally the, the working remotely while it is stressful, um, it is, is working for the county attorney's office. I wanted to especially thank David Goldstein. I kind of let him run with your virtual meeting rules um and what needed to be done to conduct this board meeting today um and he spent a lot of time with not only our own procedures but but trying to see what others in the state were doing um that being said the one of the things that i have to bring up is and you by adopting the rules, we are moving forward with a limited public hearing schedule. 
um, those projects which are in the pipeline, both quasi-judicial and legislative, which to the extent that we can tell are not controversial, will be moving with large public input, will we'll, we'll be moving forward. Uh, obviously, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't know every every project that that people might come out for. Um, we had deferred several ordinances that were in the queue. Um, one of those being the ones that you had public comment on today, which is the Lynx Golf Course, the the associated ordinance, which was amendments to Chapter Forty Two. Um, the, unfortunately, we are not able to bring that forward on the May 5th agenda because the last day to advertise was the end of last week. Uh, as Commissioner Mariano mentioned, um, we were surprised by the fact, and it just goes to show that everybody is affected, um, the newspaper scaling back their advertisements to twice a week then negate the then, then and um, their internal deadlines have extended uh, well beyond what we're used to in in dealing with legal advertisements. We can bring uh, the chapter forty two revisions to the uh, May nineteenth meeting um, if that is the board's desire. Um, I would still, I think, unless the unless Commissioner Wells um, has a particular uh, desire to move it forward, I would still think we'd we'd move the um, intersection cleanup ordinance down the pike until we had a, a a real meeting that that we could have. But but if the board wish it, and it it looks like. My best guess is the 19th will still be a virtual meeting. If you want us to, to ask the board records to advertise the chapter 42 revisions for that meeting, that will be our pleasure to do. That's, if I can get some input on that, and that's the only comments I have. Okay, I'm gonna jump in real quick. I still have concerns about anything like you mentioned before, I agree with you, Jeff, on the karate quasi judicial matters that would have long public input, what what could result from those in the future if we move forward with them. Um, I, until we know what's gonna happen, I, if we're gonna have I, anything over, you know, five, 10 people come public comment on an item, it's not gonna work well. I've watched other meetings. I've watched Hillsborough meetings, I've watched Pinellas meetings, I've watched some other meetings going on. And once you get to the point where you have a lot of public comment, it, it doesn't work well. Mr. Chairman, Jack Mariano. Please go ahead. I will tell you with the, with the links, if you're worried about the public comment there, I mean, that one person represented the estates and he's talked with the other board members there. They could have had a lot of public input today, but he just chose to be a spokesman. Uh, that can be coordinated as well. So if you're afraid of that is the issue as far as not bringing that forward, please don't let that be it. Um, they can communicate with everybody by email and let you all know how they feel, how important it is to them, but you don't have to worry about it flooding the, the airways for it. Yeah, I mean, I'll get, go back to Mr. Steinman around that too, but I know there's some concerns that he has in the attorney's office has. Those, uh, okay, so we, before, before COVID and before the shutdown and, and this being brought forward, we had we had some uh, comments from the agricultural community. Uh, we had some comments from the development community. Um, I believe that the, the agricultural community's uh, concerns were resolved. Um, and I think the development community's concerns could be re resolved, um, but there's, I, I will admit, those are still still out. Yeah, I haven't, haven't heard back from, from anybody and we haven't really 
had those discussions because of everything that's going on. But I, I feel comfortable that that those issues could be resolved by the 19th. Why don't we just bring this back and have this conversation at our next commission meeting? Because that gives you plenty of time to advertise. The I will have to advertise before your May fifth meeting for the nineteenth. Are you still? That's, that's the that's the position no. I'm in right now for the fifth. <laughs> yeah, but no, I thought you said I thought we said um, seven days. No, that's not for an ordinance that's for your notice of a virtual meeting oh, that's right okay i'm sorry and i missed what was the ordinance number again it's 10 days and, well, and, up. and because we can't advertise except on a sunday or a wednesday and we have to have lead time to the to the uh tampa bay times it's pushing us 14 to 18 days is there not another publication Especially one that's well. Is there not another publication that you could, we could be published in that at least has? I'm just talking about weekly or two publications that covers the whole county. It's got to be a newspaper of general circulation, and historically, that in Pasco, that the only thing that has been available is the Tampa Bay Times. Second, so Laker Lutz News, Suncoast News. Between the two of them. I don't know if they're not general. Those. They're not considered to be newspapers of general circulation. Sorry. All right, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mariano. Go ahead, sir. And uh, you know, I I listened real close to the agricultural community. We actually reached out to one of the attorneys that was representing some to go kind of reach out. The same thing goes as far as for the development community. I don't want to hurt the developers either, as far as with their properties to be overburdened. This is really just is designed to be a golf course type of an issue. And as far as enforcement goes and everything else, I'm hopeful that's all we're going to really push on anyway. But, you know, the, we're, the people at the links really, it's been about a year since the Gulf Coast was closed. The problems are really going to start to develop now. The dry season has gone, et cetera. And this is, is an issue that really, you don't want to kick this down the road. You want to, you want to deal with it. And again, I'm flexible to however we need to stretch, stretch it out to our, our fix it if it needs to be fixed for the development community so they're not burdened by something. Um, at the same time, I think, like, as Jeff says, we probably pretty much covered the agricultural issue. Anybody else want to chime in? We're moving on. Nothing else? Jeff, do you have anything else? I don't have anything else. Okay, clerk's office, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to the county. Um, you know, we've been going through some tough times and our office has remained open um, throughout COVID-19 and we couldn't have done it without the county's assistance, especially I want to say um, facilities management in order to keep our areas clean and um, sanitary. We have had some you know, issues pop up when we call, they've responded immediately, they've uh, responded professionally, and they've responded with care. And I just wanted to say on behalf of my team, thank you, you're um, providing us a safe environment upon which to serve our citizens. I also want to thank um, emergency management. My team has been um, very good about trying to find things on their own in regards to PPE for our team that is in the office. And um, we hit a wall and um, the um, emergency management came to our aid and pr did provide us with necessary PPE to keep our team safe. So again, I want to uh, thank emergency management. For the public, um, just another note that yes, our office is open. We are providing full service to our customers. We have a lot of services available online at our website. Um, you can find, you can go there, click on the COVID link. You'll find out everything that we have available online. Um, you can pay things online, you can uh, record documents online, you can file documents online. We also have um, legal documents and forms available for free on our website. Um, and we do have our call center open. We can take payments for everything in our call center. We are also um, working hand in hand with our customers to provide uh, payment plans with extended terms during this difficult financial time. And um, again, our front counters are open. So we're available to our customers either over the phone 
through our online services or in our office. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. And um, I will hand, I just have a couple of quick things. One, we do have to vote on an item, so I'll need action. Um, from the question of the supervisor of elections, Brian Corley, uh, we request him to appoint an alternate to the canvassing board in case it is needed. Um, the uh, supervisor of elections has recommended Mr. Brian Prescott. So if I can get him into appointing him to the canvassing board, I'd appreciate it. Move to approve Brian Prescott. This is Commissioner Starkey. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey to approve Mr. Prescott. I need a second. Second, Jack Mariano. I have a second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please take roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And I'll be real brief. I had a few more things that would go to was going to go over, but they can wait till the next meeting because I know we're running about an hour and a half back. Um, but I will again reiterate the fact from whatever the statement from everybody else. Thank you so much for our team, our staff, um, you know, obviously FASA and, and and the and the entire EM team. In addition, I think it's important to you know continue to recognize you know all our responders, fire rescue, our sheriff's office, you know the police in the local cities, our nurses and doctors, um, which are you know working really hard and, and putting their putting obviously their health at risk um in, in obviously troubled times and again there's a lot of people out there that are are still working to make sure um you know needs are bad whether it be our restaurant workers and owners of those restaurants our sanitation workers they're out there picking up their garbage again there's people out there um that, especially Boston county is obviously a great place to live and and, and, and work and play and and we just have an awesome, awesome, awesome county and just some great citizens here. And, uh, you know, one of the things, if you look at the numbers here, we won't, I won't go into the details. You all know what they are. But if you look at Pasco County and the size of our county and how much we're testing uh, compared to other counties, um, you know, those are our, our numbers, you know, quite a bit lower than some of those other ones. And I think that obviously goes back to our citizens and our citizens paying attention and taking heed to the warnings of so, doing social distancing. You know, take recommendations of wearing masks when you're outside. Our so many of our citizens are listening. We're not hearing the nightmares you're hearing in some of the other areas where people are still congregating in large groups and and having parties and things like that. So that worked, and I'm sure Chief. Um, I have that, that has to have something to do with our numbers. Again, one case is one case too many. We all know that, but. Again, I'm, I'm thankful that you know, our numbers for the size of our county aren't what we're supporting out there with some of them. So again, thank you, all of you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for the staff for putting this together today. I think it went off without a hitch. Um, and the first time ever, the Pasco County has ever had a um, VOCC meeting virtually, and we'll uh, knock it out of the park next time too. So with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Well, I, I have one thing. It's nothing we have to vote on, but if you um, remember, we're short on T. Barda. And the governor's going to be making uh, some appointments, and we really need some more names from Pasco County to be submitted. So, yeah, thank you, Commissioner. All right, stay safe, everybody. All right, we're done. Thank you.